All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are live. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight to Council's Planning and Consultation Committee meeting and wish to advise the meeting will be live streamed and recorded. The live stream and video recording will be made publicly available by YouTube and on Council's website. I'd also like to acknowledge that yesterday, the 7th of February, marks the 13th anniversary of the awful events that became known as the Black Saturday bushfires. They claimed 173 lives and thousands of homes in Victoria. So tonight on behalf of Council, I'd like to acknowledge the significance of this day and also the fact that for many in our community, the hurt and grief is ongoing. So it's important therefore that don't be recognised with appropriate sensitivity and dignity. We would like to take a moment tonight to remember all those affected, as well as the bravery of our firefighters and all emergency services personnel. I'd also like to pay acknowledgement uh, to the First Nations people uh, of the Shire. Nilambic Shire Council respectfully acknowledges that the Wawantari Woiwurrung people, uh, as the traditional owners um, on, of the country on which Nilambic is located, and we value the significance of the Wawantari people's history as essential to the unique character of the Shire. We pay tribute to all First Nations people living in Nilambic, give respect to elders past, present and, and future and extend that respect to all First Nations people. We respect the enduring strength of the Wawantari Woiwurrung and acknowledge the ongoing impacts of past trauma and injustices from European invasion, massacres and genocide committed against First Nations people. We acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Wawandri Woiwurrung people hold a deep and ongoing connection to this place. We value the distinctive place of our First Nations people in both Nilambic and Australia's identity, from their cultural her heritage and care of the land and waterways to their ongoing contributions in many fields, including academia, agriculture, art, economics, law, sport, and politics. Um, all right, at this stage, I'm going to move to apologies. There are none. So we will move to confirmation of minutes. And do I have a mover and seconder to confirm the minutes, please? Uh, who would like to move? Sorry, to Chair, just before we move to um, confirmation of minutes, if you could just um, disclose the conflicts of interest. Ah, OK. Um, so conflicts of interest. Are there any councillors who wish to disclose a conflict of interest? I go ahead, uh, councillor. Uh, thank you. Uh, apologies. I've just lost my spot. I did have something that I wanted to read out because it's important that I get this right. I don't want to make a mistake with what I'm going to say. Thank you. Um, Great, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I would just like to say that um, tonight I would like to indicate that I have an open mind and I have made a submission to um, the, um, in, in a, before I was a councillor, when I was a resident, I made a submission to the Eltham and Diamond Creek Major Activity Structure Plans um, as a councillor. At that time, I had no idea that I would become a councillor. Um, I had views that I shared as a resident. As a councillor, I'm wanting to make sure that everybody understands that I'm listening to both sides of the stories. So I haven't made up my mind as to what I'm going to be doing here, but I think it's really important that um, everyone knows that I don't have a conflict of interest and that I'm coming to this position with an open mind. Um, I'd just like to go back to governance for a moment to make sure, have I said enough there, Blaga, to ensure that um, I'm showing that I have an open mind and I haven't made up my decision about this? I suppose if I could just make this statement, you know, councillors and community, I wish to state that whilst I've previously expressed a view on this matter and as a community member made a submission on both structure plans, as an elected councillor, I recognise and accept that I have a statutory responsibility to represent and act in the best interests of the Nilambit community when participating in decision making for the council. Accordingly, I will keep an open mind by considering all the information both in favour and against the matter before objectively casting my vote. So I look forward to listening to submitters um, at this PCC meeting. I think that covers it. Would that be right? Through the Chair, um, Councillor Duffy's made the appropriate disclosures or thereof. 
Thank you. Thank you, Blaga, and thank you, uh, Councillor Duffy. All right, at this point, we're going to move to confirmation of minutes, and I'm looking for a mover and a seconder to confirm the minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Mayor Eyre. And we have a seconder in Councillor Perkins. Over to you, Mayor Eyre. Uh, the recommendation that the committee acting under the delegation from Council confirms the minutes from the planning and consultation committee meeting held on Tuesday, 16th of November, 2021, which is attachment one. So I'll put the motion to a vote, all in favour? That motion is carried. Uh, and now we are going to move on to officers reports and uh, the singular item as a consultation matter, which is the draft climate action plan, 2022-2032 community feedback, which is also item PCC.001 slash uh, 22. Uh, we have seven speakers with this report and each of those speakers has three minutes. And I believe our first speaker is Gila Schnapp, uh, who is calling in by phone. And uh, Gila, can you hear us? Uh, I'll check again, Gila, are you on? She's on mute. She's on mute. Somehow she's on mute. Um, I don't know how to, Gila, we'll need to press Oh, star six on her phone to unmute. Gilla, if you can look at the key, keypad of your phone and press star six, you should be unmuted. Give it a go. There's an ominous silence um, coming down the phone line. So we could probably move on and come back to Gilla, if that's okay. All right, uh, in that case, we'll see if we can speak to uh, Esther. Uh, Caspi, uh, wait, someone's calling user four. Are you there? Testing the line. Hello, can you hear Hello. me? Hello, yes, we can. Uh, is, oh, that, um, okay. Gilla? is that Gilla or Esther? No, you've got Esther here. Um, okay. I'm a little nervous. This is the first time I've been able to get through, so okay. bear with me. Yep. And I don't even have um, what's in front of me, so I presume you're doing the MPS. Uh, no, where this item is the draft climate action plan, Esther? No, I'm not um, speaking on the, um, I wasn't able to do it in time on the climate action plan, but Gilla definitely was going to say just a couple of very quick words, but I'm surprised that you can't get through to her. Um, we're you we're equal to go, Or can you have a go later? Otherwise, she'll just do the next one. Hopefully, oh. she'll get in. All right, thanks, Espa. Well, if you won't be speaking to this, I guess we're moving down the line to Elizabeth Doig. I think Elizabeth is in the waiting room and may be able to speak to us. Just waiting for Elizabeth, who's about to be admitted. Possibly. Now, there, there she is. There's Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. You're muted at the moment. Um, Hello, Jeff. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Um, are you going to share your screen with us or just remain the name Elizabeth no. Doy? No, you can certainly see me. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Um, All it's right. 10 minutes, as you well know. So uh, the Zoom is yours. OK, thanks, Jeff. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to the Draft Climate Action Plan. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Nilambic Climate Emergency Action Team here, um, NSEAT. So I, I wanted to talk to two main points today in, rela in relation to the Climate Action Plan. The first is that we're delighted at NSEAT that the Council has agreed to a climate emergency response. But we really strongly believe that the, that the word, that the inclusion of the word declaration instead of acknowledgement would send a really clear message to the Nilambic community, other councils and higher levels of government that this council is prepared to take the climate emergency seriously and treat it with the urgency it requires. Other councils who've used the word declaration have reported that it's had the effect of placing climate action as a key priority for all council operations and has helped prioritize resources to tackle the climate, to, to tackle the climate emergency. We consider that language is really important here. Uh, the second point I want to raise is the issue of community 
zero emissions targets and carbon budgets. Ironbark Sustainability recommends using the concept of carbon budgets to assist councils in setting appropriate and responsible targets. They have calculated a science-derived target for Nillimbeek, which scales the global carbon budget in line with the IPCC recommendations down to a local level based on a council emissions profile, growth trajectory, and relative ability to reduce emissions. On the basis of this, they calculate that Nillimbeek has a carbon budget of eight years in which to re reach net zero emissions for the community. That is by 2030. So we haven't got long. They also stated that councils should set the most ambitious targets possible. Furthermore, they should apply a climate lens to all decisions consistent with the meaning of a climate emergency and commensurate with the challenge. So, we realise this is a big ask. Community targets are harder to reach than those for council operations and they're less in council's control. And while it's not the council's responsibility alone to meet community-wide targets, they do have a clear role in setting an appropriate agenda and facilitating collaboration, support and action at all levels of the community, business and government. It also requires a significant shift in the behaviour and practices of the community which is where a strong community engagement and outreach program is needed to bring the community on board with clear messaging. On the plus side, Nillimbeek has many passionate and involved members of the community and a strong history of environmental activism. A barrier to achieving our suggested target is available council resources, as we know we have a low, low rate base. However, in terms of cost, every dollar spent in climate mitigation now will save $10 in 10 years time with the cost of dealing with the consequences of catastrophic climate impacts. And this meets, needs to be made clear to Nillimbeek ratepayers. Thanks, Elizabeth. We're just over time. Sorry about that. No worries, Jeff. There's more I want to say, but that's fine. Um, we'll move on. So, Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the submission. Um, all right. Now, unless we're going to try and get her again, we, we will try and get her again. Um, we're going to um, hope that Gillow can dial in. I can see the phone icon there. Jeff, is there the opportunity to ask Elizabeth any questions? Oh. No. Uh, no, she's because she's presenting on behalf of... Oh, I see. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 No, sorry. Just waiting to see if... Hello. Hello. Is can that Gillow? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, you're on. You've got three minutes, Gillow. Okay. Now, I also didn't have time to prepare this, so I'm going to just do a few brief comments okay. on the cuff so you understand it, okay? Mm -hmm. I need to say that um, fire is the most important, um, important thing that we have to be concerned about with, uh, with climate change because there's also been shocking, unprecedented fires um, and fire tornadoes, fire storms. And because of that, I believe that it's been totally neglected and downplayed in your climate change. And yet, it, yet it's the most important concern we should all have. It does, with examples, I have suggestions that land use planning must change. It must be reviewed because particularly areas um, within three to five kilometres of a major activity centre structure plan like Diamond Creek. And um, they have a, a structure plan inappropriate, not fit for purpose, with four and five storey buildings that landowners will be able to, or investors will be able to contest if the structure plan goes ahead and may actually get passed. We're talking about five and six storey buildings in the areas by the railway station in precinct six, three, in precinct four and precinct five and storeys of three levels. I don't know how that ever got through in the school area, a large area, double the size of the Church Street precinct one, where the high school and the Diamond Creek Primary School and they also are around um, large, you know, also around acreages. But these, the land use and the necessi necessity to review smaller acreages 
so that fire can be better controlled and also um, situations like us where we have, we're a couple of kilometres from the town centre of Tute Street and we have unique pressures and flows measured in 2001 at over 2100 kPa, an incredible pressures and flows. Now, if they don't review the land use of our area, those water pressures and flows will be diverted to other areas in Diamond Creek and Yarrambat on a first-in, best-dressed basis. And our properties that I have an interest in, in Iron Bark Road and also adjoining Pioneer Road with dual supply of water reticulation, high pressures and flows, as well as other infrastructure, we would not be able to protect ourselves from fire because we'll be left with no pressures and flows as our ward councillor, Peter Perkins, can, can uh, tell you that's very important for fire. And well, um, um, Gilla, Gilla that's, um, that's terrific. And thank you so much. We're out of time, unfortunately, but you've covered uh, a whole bunch of um, subjects there. And I think that I can ask councillors if they have any questions for Gilla, they can ask them now. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, uh, Councillor Ramtaran. Uh, thank you, Councillor Payne. Yes, Gilla, um, you're, you said you're presenting on behalf of Adjunct Billy. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell me what Adjunct Billy is and what services it provides well, to the I'm community. The, the, the off the cuff um, presentation now I'm doing on my, myself as a site specific, not the company, and that is in um, the, okay, that's the registration. Fine. That's fine, Gilla. That's, that's, uh, that's understood. Um, could, would you be able to yeah. tell me what Adjunct Billy is and what it, what services it provides to the community? Well, actually, I don't think that's relevant because the company's not presenting today. So that's totally inappropriate and irrelevant. I'm not speaking on behalf of the company. We would, we're would going to have a representative, a legal solicitor, represent on the behalf of the company now today. And that's why I'm not presenting on behalf of the company. I am presenting, I also registered as a site specific property and today I am talking about my submission as a site specific property. That's why I drew in properties I have an interest in in Pioneer Road. They don't belong um, to Gilla, there's, there's probably some confusion because you listed twice, both as an uh, individual and on behalf of Adjunct Billy. So yes. um, you are listed a couple That's of times right. in both those yes. cases. I'm just going to throw it open now to uh, any other councillors that may want to. Yes, we have. Councillor Duffy has a question for you, Gilla. Yes, thank you, Gilla. Thank you. I hear loud and clear your concern about fire and acknowledge um, that yesterday was the 13th anniversary of the Black Saturday bushfires. Um, hearing what you've said today, I'm just wondering, are there other parts of the Climate Action Plan that you um, I feel that we've done yes. a good job on or that you'd like to address? No, I don't think you did a good job at all on the fact that urban dwellers can contribute a lot to the forestry and, and the greenery for climate change. And I think that it should be mandatory for them to plant vegetation. Even high density housing can have vertical vegetation. And I don't think that people in houses who love the green wedge and expect the rural landowners to provide for the green wedge to be the only ones providing for climate change it should be every, there's 56,000 or so, was it 60,000 of urban dwellers? There's no reason why they can't pay if they can't fit it on their own property. If each person planted one tree in those, in those houses, we're talking about 60,000 trees a year by one person. Now, surely an emphasis has to be made on that. The other thing, there's not enough emphasis on public transport that won't have emissions, like they've got new, they're trialling new bicycles that they're in the city, you might have heard of it, that, that do not use, do any emissions. I think they're battery operated or some other way. There's no reason why we can't have them along our paths. And I've already suggested that new paths be done along Iron Bark Road, which is an arterial road. There's plenty of space there mm -hmm. for such transportation, walking and motorised vehicles. There's even, there's even golf motorised vehicles. There's a lot of transportation that can assist in reducing our emissions. It also includes public transport, minibuses, 
And I lived in an area in the United States where they had mini buses that would pick people up from their addresses and that would so considerably lower the amount of cars used and cars emissions. Um, Gilla, we've got um, Councillor Perkins ready to ask you a question, if that's okay. Thanks again, Gilla, for your submission. Um, you spoke about um, the necessity, and I, I, I certainly join uh, you in expressing your views about the necessity of, of um, you know, residential pro properties in, in urban areas to um, increase tree canopy and, and vegetation. But I think it's also important that um, absentee landlords and, and owners of commercial properties uh, do the same. We certainly have a problem in Diamond Creek, as you're aware, with uh, landlords that uh, don't invest enough on their property. Uh, and, and the assumption always is that it's council property, but it's, it's private property. Would you uh, concur with me on that one? Yes, I support you 100%. We're also, the company, not myself, but the company is also a, a, an owner of commercial property in the original town centre. And yes, I believe we would be quite happy to spend money uh, equally with other commercial people, and I think they should. And if they don't, cannot fit it on their own properties, I think they should be taxed so they can put those plantation on other properties and pay for the tree transport, the trees. Also, there's no reason why people can't be encouraged to give gifts. Instead, when you have a wedding or you have a birthday, why not offer so many a present to buy so many trees to be planted in areas, even desert areas, so that the increased vegetation can be increased throughout Victoria and why not have Newland Bic as a model to show and advertise how every urban person in the state of Victoria can be encouraged to buy trees and gift trees as presents. Um, so well, thank you. Thank you for those um, suggestions. I think I'll be back a couple of times and it's good to know that the uh, phone connection is working so well. Um, I'm just looking around to see if there's any other councillors hoping to ask a question. I don't think there are. So thank you, Gilla. Um, we'll be coming back to you later in the evening. Thank you very much. And at thank this you. point, I think we're moving on to Mitzi Tuk, who should be coming into the Zoom. There she is. She's appeared now and um, she will reveal herself and come off mute. Any second now. Just, yeah, she's off mute. And she revealed, there she is, Mitzi. Fantastic yes. to have you here. Um, three minutes, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much. I'm from the Millenbeck Climate Emergency Action Team, but talking as an individual. A lot of thought has been devoted into preparing the draft climate action plan, and it is the culmination of a process that has involved a number of steps over time. While I endorse many aspects of the draft plan, I feel that the language and the terms in which our Shire's action on climate are framed need to be stronger in order to convey to the community the urgency of council action on climate. Throughout the draft document, particularly on page 11, the word risk is used. For example, council accepts climate science and recognises that climate change as a foreseeable risk Risk is defined as a situation involving exposure to possible danger. However, there is sufficient high level evidence now widely accepted that climate change is a threat, not merely a risk. I suggest that council change risk to threat in the plan. Commensurate with the threat that climate change is, council should declare that climate, that climate change is an emergency, not merely acknowledge that it is so. If something is an emergency, it warrants strong, swift action. And acknowledging that something is an emergency is an oxymoron. An emergency is seen for what it is, something that warrants immediate and concerted action and is, or shortly beforehand, has been declared unequivocally as such. It does appear that Council is committed to act. So the Climate Action Plan needs to have climate emergency framed in strong language to all stakeholders that backs the commitment and conveys the sense for urgent action. 
I would like to see even stronger council and municipal emissions reduction targets and interim three-year emissions reduction targets in place. Councils are ideally placed to lead other government jurisdictions in setting ambitious targets. I would like to see Council aim for a carbon neutral target by 2025 for its own operations and for Council to aim for community emissions to be carbon neutral by 2030. This time frame is realistic. Ironbark Sustainability has produced a science-derived target specifically for the Shire of Nilambic, which calculates a scaled carbon budget of eight years based on current emissions. This target is the target to aim for in order to keep global temperature increase well below two degrees. Nilambic Shire needs to closely coordinate with other jurisdictions and industrial sectors, which in turn need to implement their own science-derived targets so that we can meet the challenges ahead. Lovely timing. Thank you, Mitzi, for that. Thank you for your submission. Um, and uh, at this stage, um, you're speaking on behalf of yourself, so are there any councillors that would like to ask a question of the submitter? Yes, uh, Councillor Duffy has a question for you, Mitzi. Thank you. Hi, Mitzi. Thank you very much for speaking tonight. Um, I am um, hearing the strong language that you're wanting Council to, um, you know, uh, reflect in our document, Climate Threat, Declare a Climate Emergency. And one of the things I'm really keen to hear from you is uh, if, if with strong, swift action, what are some of the actions that you think are necessary to be able to reach the, the um, targets that you're suggesting? Does our climate action plan cover that in enough detail for you? Uh, look, I think I'd like to see a little bit more emphasis on um, uh, um, a push for um, EVs and um, uh, uh, electric active transport and um, liaising with the um, community to um, uh, promote that and um, possibly more sort of, you know, charging stations and um, uh, I suppose sort of, you know, even more of a push for um, uh, solar because uh, the best way to um, uh, um, charge your EV is undoubtedly through solar panels uh, on your roof. Um, and look, I, th I think uh, being a speech therapist, um, I do see that um, language in itself uh, is of worth and merit to convey the sense of urgency to, uh, to the community who may not otherwise know of everything that the council is doing. I think it also um, sends a good, strong message to, um, uh, indus to industry uh, and, um, you know, sort of uh, other sectors and um, uh, also, um, uh, also other jurisdictions. So uh, I, I, th I, th I think strong language in itself is of great value. Thank you, um, Mitzi. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions for Mitzi? All right, uh, Mitzi, thank you very much for your submission. Um, we're going to move to um, Virginia Rochelle, who is, I hope, in the waiting room. Uh, there she is, I'm about to come onto the Zoom. And... You will unmute and switch on the camera. Yep. Can there you hear me? You are. Yes, we can hear you and we can see you clearly. Virginia, the Zoom is yours. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak uh, in support of my submission. I'm glad that Council is recognising the threats we all face and the urgency of action required. Um, as the pandemic has hopefully taught us, we must heed the warnings of the scientists, risk assessors and medical specialists about the likely future impacts of a quickly warming climate. I want my local council to join the more than 100 other local councils in Australia and declare a climate emergency. A declaration would show that council is serious in recognising the urgency and importance of acting as quickly as we can while we can. 
After all, you wouldn't simply acknowledge that a huge bushfire was coming. Of course, if a climate emergency is declared, then the action and the budget must reflect that it is an emergency. I support the other most common recommendations made from community submissions as listed for this meeting. A couple of plan items I want to comment on. Under focus area one, objective 1.2, Supporting and encouraging staff to be engaged is great, but I'm sure that there's more that can be done, such as training and educating staff and ensuring specific actions are embedded in performance and development plans. Under the same objectives, I don't think it's enough to plan and prioritise for climate action. It needs to include appropriate funding to ensure Council meets these targets. And to focus area three, it's good that Council recognises the effects of extreme heat as well as bushfire risk since extreme heat apparently killed more people than bushfire around Black Saturday. So improved building thermal envelope requirements and helping existing homeowners improve thermal comfort in homes is not just related to reducing emissions, it's also about health. I don't have time to comment on the other areas but, that I'd like to, but I'll just say three quick things. I agree that passive language, like some of that found in the, in the plan, is not really good for conveying action and seriousness to the community. Two, I don't think he can give too much information to the community about this broad issue. The lack of awareness is still really evident. Three, we are also in an ecological crisis. So when trying to reduce bushfire risk, we need to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm sure I haven't said anything you've not heard before, but I wanted to add my voice and to help you hear how important this issue is to me. I support the work of the Nilambic Climate Emergency Action Team and other groups like them in our community who give their time and energy to help us all move faster on this problem. Please help make Nilambic the proactive forward-thinking LGA it can be. Declare a climate emergency and find a way to fund it as though you mean it. Perfect timing, Virginia. Excellent. To the second. Thank you so much for your submission. Um, I'll throw it open. Yes, we have um, Councillor Perkins has a question for you. Yeah, thanks for your comment, Virginia. I just um, quickly, is what, when you, you know, your belief that extreme heat um, caused more deaths than bushfire um, Black Saturday, uh, you're talking about statewide or, or, or Australia wide, certainly not Nilambic. Uh, probably not Nilambic, no, sorry. It's probably statewide. That's something that I've yeah. that I've read as a council employee, actually, in a neighbouring oh, yeah. county. Yeah. Hmm. Just, yeah, yeah, 13 years ago yesterday, um, Black Saturday, there were, there were 25 people uh, Nilambic yes. who died of, of the bushfire. So well, do we actually know how many died in Nilambic from extreme heat? It's one of those kind of difficult topics, but it, it is, you know, very deadly and could be very deadly in future. That's, that's really the point I was trying to make. Yeah. Thank you. All right, any other questions for Virginia? No, in that case, thank you, Virginia, for your submission. Thank you. Um, and we have the, the last speaker for the Climate Action Plan and it's Laurie Niven, who uh, is coming into the Zoom as we speak. And yes, an experienced Zoomer. All right, Laurie, you've got um, three minutes and the Zoom is yours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're on. Looking for my face, couldn't see it. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. This action plan, I have to say, is possibly the most important set of instructions that you will ever give to council officers. So first, I want to underline the statement by Melbourne Uni that what cli the climate crisis desperately requires is a transformational response, which means examining systems and processes across the entire organization and beyond, including stakeholders, supply chain, ratepayers, residents, and businesses. In 2018, the IPCC used 2030 as the interim date en route to 2050. And in October, pre-COP26, the UN man was saying, we're still on track for climate catastrophe that leaders can still make a difference, but the era of half measures and hollow promises must end. 
Now, I'm not saying that Council's draft action plan is full of hollow promises, far from it, but it needs more details and more demanding timelines. If we don't yet have baseline data, the target for producing it is 2022, not as it becomes available, as I've read. The gathering of a community advisory committee needs to happen in 2022. We are the green, the green Wedge Shire. I feel we can do this. But the UN man talking about climate catastrophe was not just using that as a throwaway phrase. So the second thing I want to say is about council's um, priorities that are shown on, in the graphic, the second graphic on page nine. Priority one is shown as bushfires. In fact, I understand bushfires are really important, but in fact, council's top two priorities need to be to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2030 or earlier, and those of the community by 2035 or earlier. And number two, to place climate considerations front and center in all your decision-making in all council decision-making. It's fine that bushfire actions come next, absolutely. It's just that there will be more bushfires if those top two aren't addressed. And 2030, the next eight years will pass in a flash. I mean, yes, Black Saturday, it was already 13 years ago yesterday. So my submission said a lot about declaring declaring a climate emergency, you need to do that. You need to say May Day to council officers because they need that mindset. Thank you, Laurie, for that great submission. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to throw it open to councillors now. Does anyone have a question for Laurie? No, we don't. Oh, yes, we do. Uh, Councillor Duffy. Thank you very much, Laurie, for your considered um, submission. Um, with the May Day call out that you're doing and with the actions to um, reprioritise what is the main point in the climate, the main focus, so instead of bushfire being top one, I'm going back to your graph and looking at um, um, greenhouse gases, are there some particular um, actions that you would like to see council um, introduce to help achieve that? Like I'm wondering, would you be go so far as saying, council, would you please stop having, um, for new homes and new developments, please don't have gas, only have electricity so it can be solar generated, et cetera. So I'm just wondering if you might be able to give us, you know, two or three or, um, ideas to help achieve the um, number one priority that you see we should be focusing on. Uh, well, I say thank you for mentioning gas because uh, that's more of a worry than a lot of people seem to appreciate. Um, and that kind of education is really good. I put quite a lot in my submission. I like the microgrids idea. Uh, I'm very happy that you've got a solar farm, which I haven't seen yet, but, but um, an extension of, of that idea. The, the regenerative farming is something that can be promoted with our small landowners. Um, yeah, I, I tried to list quite a lot. I didn't want to try and go there tonight because three minutes isn't long enough. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Laurie. Um, and uh, at that point, I think we have gone through all the submitters and the statements, and I'm going to look for a mover for the recommendation. And that is Councillor Ramcharan. I'm looking for a second. Oh, actually, the mover to read the motion. Okay, no. We get the seconder and then we go with the motion. So a seconder, please. That is Councillor Duffy. And I'll ask uh, Councillor Ramshan to read the motion, please. Uh, thank you, Councillor Payne. I'd like to move that the committee acting under delegation from council acknowledges and considers the matters contained in the oral and written submissions during finalization of the draft climate action plan, 2022 to 2023 and attachment one. Makes the 2021 Shire climate action plan, 2022 to 2032, available um, the sorry, consulta consultation findings report in attachment to available to the public on council's website 
three requests a further report to be presented at the April 2022 Council meeting to adopt the final version of the Climate Action Plan 2022 to 2032. Four, resolves that the confidential unredacted copies of written submissions and survey responses to the public engagement for the Climate Action Plan, and that's in red there just because it said MPS on the agenda, we've changed it to Climate Action Plan, consultation and a detachments for all, and six remain confidential on the ground specified in the definition of confidential information in the Local Government Act. And five, thanks all submitters for providing Council with feedback on this important document. Thank you, Councillor Ramcharan. Uh, we have a seconder in Councillor Duffy. Um, so I'll ask Councillor Ramcharan if you'd like to speak to the motion. Thank you, Councillor Payne. Um, I, I think it'll come as no surprise to people. This is a really important issue to me. Um, as a young person, I will have to live with uh, the effects of what we do today. And I think I agree with the submitters uh, in, in saying that this really is urgent. And I, I absolutely right to say mayday because that's what um, our current young generations and future generations should all be saying right now i really um i'd really like to thank officers uh from the from our environment team who put so much effort into this plan and they've worked so closely with councillors behind the scenes for a very long time to put this plan together so it really has taken a lot of work um and i think it really is quite strong uh, which is good to see, and we need governments to make strong plans to tackle the climate emergency. Uh, the, submission, the submitters have all pointed to ways that it could be made stronger, and I'm happy to consider all of that in finalising the plan, which will be coming to us at the April meeting. Just to touch on a few points that were made by submitters, uh, I think the obvious one that was mentioned by almost all of our submitters today was the question of, do we declare, do we acknowledge? Um, in, a, in a way, it, they, they both do have the same effect. If you, if you look at the um, Climate Emergency Australia criteria, we would, we would be listed as a council that's declared a climate emergency, whether we use acknowledge or declare. I certainly prefer the word declare. I think it is stronger, and I think it really is the language that ought to be used. Um, but it does come down to a question of what people are comfortable with. And I want all councillors to be comfortable with this climate plan because it's something that going forwards we all need to be able to fund and implement there's no point having a plan that we're divided on that we can't get funding for that we can't implement because um, there's something in there that people are uncomfortable with so that's why i'm happy to settle with the word acknowledge rather than declare uh, but at the end of the day that will be i guess a vote for council in april and we'll see what we what we land on but just to give a little bit of of rationale there behind why that word has been chosen because uh, i think it really it's something that means the plan can bring us all together rather than dividing us and that's really important if we're going to fund it and implement it um, i think it was interesting that virginia raised that point on extreme heat that's something i'm gonna i'm gonna look up because that's a really interesting point um, and one thing that's not really elaborated on so much within the plan uh, there was a huge amount of work done with our insurance provider to do a risk assessment where we assessed all of the risks from our operational activities that are posed by climate change. And it kept coming back to extreme heat and the fact that people at council events and people on public land will be suffering from extreme heat and residents will need shelter from extreme heat, especially residents who are vulnerable. Um, so it is there, it is in our risk register now, thanks to our insurance provider who did a wonderful job uh, making an incredibly thorough risk register that covers many, many pages. Uh, and it's something that is has formed part of our risk management, even though it's not fully elaborated on within the plan. I, I would like to um, make some of that stuff public. I'm not sure if it is confidential or not, but perhaps that's something we should discuss with officers about whether we can make that public because I'm sure there'd be a lot of interest in it. Um, I think Laurie pointed to the graphics in the plan that show the top right priorities. Um, I asked a similar question, Laurie, and those graphics are actually based on the findings from the community consultation. So that's why the priorities are in that order. It doesn't necessarily reflect council's priorities under the climate action plan. Um, but I think you have made a good point in that it, it possibly is misleading and could be misinterpreted. Uh, so maybe that graphic could be rejigged and we could make it a little bit clearer um, as to what that is referencing. 
Um, in terms of the carbon budgets, I think that's a, a really interesting topic. Uh, and it showed, you know, it, scientifically, we have eight years to reach that net zero target, which is much more ambitious than what we've got in the plan. And I think the plan itself is incredibly ambitious given uh, the targets that we're dealing with from our state and federal governments. So um, to be honest, I, I, I don't think we alone as a council will be able to bring ourselves and the community to net zero by 2030. But I think that's where lobbying and advocacy come in, advocacy come in. And it's really important that we do that advocacy to higher levels of governments so that they can actually do the work to support us to bring our community to net zero as soon as we possibly can, because it really is urgent and uh, we need to do that in order to avert catastrophe. And if that's what the science is saying, well, that's what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ramcharan. Um, uh, Councillor Duffy, did you want to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you. It's great to hear um, submitters tonight. And I also go back a step and thank all of the people in the community who have added to this plan. Um, I've really listened to the words and the, um, the, the passion behind them about declaring a climate emergency. And if I just take myself back to um, the conversation that was about, uh, raised about extreme heat, I remember on the Saturday of um, the Black Saturday, um, standing at about 8.30 in the morning, putting clothes on the clothesline, heavily pregnant and also with a 10 month old baby. And I said to myself at that time, oh my God, it's so hot today. What is it gonna be like in 30 years time? What is it gonna be like for my babies when they're older? And you know, that time has gone in a flash. And as some of our presenters have said tonight, um, eight years goes fast. So I am kind of feeling very uncomfortable um, as a councillor with this um, climate emergency on our doorstep. I think we've got a fabulous climate action plan. And I'm really glad that we've got that. I've listened to what people have got to say and I'm still open to more information from people. Um, but I don't think the way to go is to make everybody feel comfortable about climate action um, and to make people feel comfortable about our climate action plan. Because if I am... Um, you know, a lobster in boiling water, I'm not going to be comfortable as the temperature keeps, as in cold water, as the temperature keeps um, um, being raised up. Uh, I don't know why that analogy came to my head, but I'm just saying I really would like us to walk the talk and to challenge people. And if we don't have aspirations to bring people along, if we feel like we can't achieve targets, then we won't. Uh, if we go back to a very... Um, um, basic principle of going on a diet. If I think I can lose 10 kilos, I'm really going to try damn hard to, to do that. If I think, oh, look, I'm not going to be able to do it, then, you know, I might have, you know, it, it just weakens that resolve. So as a council, I'd like us to listen to the community and their comments, um, respond to the actions that they've suggested and really work hard to ensure that our climate action plan is not just council making action, but bringing along residents, as we've heard from our submitters tonight, to say that the education and the action is really important from residents to do their part as well. So that's kind of one of the key things in the climate action plan. How do we help educate people to um, feel that their contribution to this can make a difference in a meaningful way? Uh, thank you, Councillor Duffy. I'm looking around to see if there any other councillors would like to speak. Yes, uh, Mayor Eyre, the Zoom is yours. Thank you, Councillor Payne. Um, I'm just going to be really quick. I just wanted to say thank you to all those who have submitted and spoke, um, spoke tonight. And I heard declare versus acknowledge, uh, reducing carbon emissions, um, uh, using a transformational approach, including education and training, um, and that I'm really looking forward to April to endorsing the final version with um, minor or major changes uh, before. I don't think we can do major changes, but with the changes and endorsing it in April. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor Eyre. Uh, are there any other councillors like to speak? In that case, um, I think I'll move down to the point where I will put the motion to a vote and I will ask all those in favour of the motion. That motion is carried. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone. That concludes my section of the meeting. I'm going to hand over to Councillor Perkins for his part of the Planning Matters Committee. Um, Councillor Perkins, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Councillor Payne. Um, so we've got uh, uh, three or four planning matters tonight. The first one is uh, proposed amendment C143 and C144, the Normic Planning Scheme, implementation of the Eltham and Diamond Creek Major Activity Centre Structure Plans 2020. Um, we received 12 submitters. Um, one of those uh, submitters is not 
able to attend uh, tonight and here's an apology um, in Johnford condo. Uh, we therefore have seven in person and uh, we've got another three that I'll, another couple that I'll read out. Yeah, three that I'll read out. Uh, so to open the batting, it's Gillish Knapp. Gilla, are you there? I think you need to press star six. I saw. Hello. Yep. Hi, Gilla. You're on. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, Gilla. Okay. Now, listen. I'm sorry to say this. I don't want to be complaining, but I wrote to Council. Hang on, hang on, Gilla. We'll just start. We'll just start the clock if we could. Yes, I would like Adrian Billy's submission to be read out first, and I would like Esther Catsby's submission to be read out first. And I asked council to do this for me three times. So I would like you as chair to use your powers as chair of the committee to read those two submissions out. And then you can read my submission out at any time of, of this agenda that you want. But those two submissions have to be read out first. And that was requested last week, this week, and several times via text, telephone conversations and all else. And I was given different stories. One minute I was told that governance will decide. Another minute Rosa said to me that the mayor or the chair will decide. So therefore, as chair, I'm asking you to make that decision, please, Peter, yeah. because I'm not quite ready for my submission now because I haven't been feeling too well. So if you could read those two in the meantime and put mine up, put mine in, even if, uh, even if it's at the end of your hearing the other activity centre, I don't mind when, you can choose. But I want those two read out now that you've mentioned. All right. Um, All right, Gil, I'll use my extraordinary okay. powers. And because you've asked so nicely, I'll start with you and then um, I'll go to Esther. Um, so no, it's not, it's, no, it's, that's not what I said. It was Adjun Billy's written submission. Which yes, I yes. Had on behalf of Adjun Billy. That's, that, it says Gil Schnapp on behalf of Adjun Billy, oh, Proprietary yes. Limited, a director. Okay. Apologies. And then Esther's. And then later on, any time yep. you want, I'll okay. do my piece. Thanks, Peter. So you put yourself on mute. Thanks. Um, so this is Adjun Billy. Uh, please abandon Amendment C144. There is no room, room for in needed serious correction of the plan, which this amendment stage, i.e. changing, no, oh, sorry. There is no room for needed serious correction of the plan with this amendment stage, i.e. changing the activity centre structure plan boundary to include Collins Street, Main Street, Diamond Creek Priory in brackets, Green State, and Sacred Heart Primary School in brackets ran state. Re-exhibit the DCAC MAC structure plan afresh with a genuine open and transparent public process to create an entirely new plan. The public process for a new plan must follow the completion of the housing strategy. It defines all planning logic and fairness that this plan can be informed by a 21 year old housing strategy, exclamation mark. We consider it unacceptable to implement this plan via C 144 with its insufficient superficial public outing during this pandemic, whereby the normal consultation process has been seriously restrained. I um, in bracket, to this date, we have been denied the infrastructure strategies to provide for this plan, and we're unable to access the impact on our property. A sentiment echoed throughout the public submissions. The only people notified in writing in Shoot Street were the businesses, freeholder owners. Surely Diamond Creek Primary School and Sacred Heart School should have been notified, particularly as they were newly excluded, while the high school of Diamond Creek East Primary continued to be included. The map, the map approved by Council for Exhibition did not get included with the exhibition documents. This was unlike the process in Eltham to allow the public to draw comparisons and to fully understand the implications. Please see attached maps. These are just two examples that show the poor consultation, poor community engagement, poor feedback for this plan. To us, it presented as a sham process without general commitment to asking for and understanding community sentiment. Cohesion and cons consolidation should be the aim instead of disseminating the old in favour of the new. The unbalanced inequitable prejudicial treatment presented in this plan to the advantage of Precinct 4 and its adjoining precincts is a dismal outcome for Shute Street, Collins Street and Main Street businesses. It is known that small commercial strips are becoming, less, are becoming less and less viable and many are dying. This structure plan needs to account for this threat and instead of restricting and curtailing its options for investment and growth, 
needs to support and encourage in any way possible the potential of these areas. Apart from not opening equal opportunities to all these businesses, Shoot, Street and Surrounds are losing their critical identity and sense of place as the original township of Diamond Creek. Councils must make informed decisions and vote accordingly to rescue Shoot Street, Diamond Creek's proper and original town centre. Denigrating Shoot Street to one for local convenient shopping and then uh, designating it as a commercial strip and detailing its retail and other expansion is against all planning principles. Changing the zone in precinct three and five from industrial to commercial is another blow to this original area without reinstating Shoot Street as a retail node with equal hierarchy and rights to precinct four. Two more sentences. All these changes, that strategic directions appear to favour what was formerly known as East Diamond Creek. The original boundaries of Diamond Creek are being rewritten. We question who stands to gain from these changes. Yet another substantial, yet again, substantial issues in our, in our submissions have been discredited and ignored. We reserve all our rights. Justice for proper original town centre of Diamond Creek and its surrounding does not date. Thank you, Ajahn Billy. Next, what we'll do, uh, Gilla, we'll come back to you at the end, but I'll go through to the order. So I've, I've just uh, replaced uh, the company's submission with yours for the moment, and we'll go on to number two in person, and that's Carlotta Quinlan. So Carlotta, if you're still with us. Yep, you've popped up Carlotta. Um, <laughs> Right. Start whenever you want. If you don't, if you don't want to um, reveal yourself. Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. Right. Is that right? Thanks very much. Um, okay, I've got one for EKAG and one for myself. Is that okay if I do them both one after the other? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, so this is um, Elton Community Action Group's um, submission. Just let us know when that one's finished because we can't ask any questions of you on that one, but we might be able to ask questions on, of your own. Yep, sure do. Thanks. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. The extra time allowed for comment has been appreciated, but unfortunately the time of year has meant that many have been on holidays or coping with COVID in one way or another. So interacting less than usual on the complexity of the Olympic planning scheme. However, in discussion with the ECAG committee and other members of the community, and while acknowledging the positive features in the amendment, several ambiguities and concerns were raised, including increase in height stories, particularly on the west side of the railway line and on the government owned railway land. We assume this, rel this rel is reliant on the government wanting to sell or develop that land. Even if most options in precinct three were not taken up, four or five stories along that area fronting the sporting and community group land would make a huge impact on the area. A four to five story wall from Diamond Street to the Oval Pavilion. The increase from three to five stories in the central station area would have a similar impact on Main Road. What degree of concern was expressed by the community regarding extra stories during the consultation stage? Has this been taken into account? While acknowledging that the government expects us to cater for some growth, we are not in a growth corridor and the government expectation of our provision of extra housing is not high, as shown by the data available during the housing strategy consultation. We therefore query the need and justification for this level of possible development density. Reasons for allowing discretionary heights to be exceeded were felt to be somewhat vague and could be strengthened. In precinct five, Heights towards the library on the old Shire office site are said to be lower than further north. However, this isn't shown in the diagram. The library is nestled well into the hill, far below the other land. How will three storeys on the library land and four storeys on the old Shire office site not overwhelm and destroy the integrity of this iconic building? While there are several comments regarding the old Shire office land, community use of the land is not mentioned and certainly not given priority. The Cypress Trees and Cenotaph Precinct are mentioned as examples of community assets and heritage values. We query what is meant by Cenotaph Precinct. As the War Memorial Building Complex is on the agenda for local heritage recognition, we feel that it should also be included, as not doing so could be seen to downgrade its value as an important memorial and slice of history. 
We believe that changes to the above areas of concern need to be made and hope they can be done without the need for costly consultants. Thank you. That's ECAGS. Yes, Carlotta. Just go on with your submission now and then we'll ask questions at the oh, end. Okay. <sighs> right, sorry. <laughs> The inclusion on the December council meeting agenda of the Eltham ACZ draft for approval came as something of a surprise to me, having been much involved and concerned with this adoption 20 months ago by the previous council. December, even in normal times, is not a time for the community to be council focused. And last December was certainly not normal times. Some changes that had been made to the ACZ were very positive, but others had raised concerns. The timing of the December release of the document gave no time for clarification or discussion with planners or councillors. So the opportunity of extra time to allow clarification of various points and mention areas of concern has been appreciated. A very positive feature of the draft is the revised precinct two setbacks, particularly the change to 5.5 metres from the boundary. It will certainly clarify matters at BCAT. There's a discrepancy in the draft regarding side setbacks in precinct two. The text mentions four metres, but the diagram shows two metres. The reference to clause 55 not applying to buildings of more than five storeys is somewhat misleading, as the only area to which that could apply is the narrow strip on Circulatory Road or the corner of Luck and Main Road. Attachments seven and eight refer to the SLO, significant landscape overlay, being updated and improving its use in protecting particular trees in the EMAC. These changes appear to be, the changes appear to be the date and the word substantial. I understand it to be a significant landscape overlay, not a significant tree overlay. And its purpose is to protect the landscape, which as the schedule states, covers urban design, colors, materials in the area proposed for development. Is there a way to state this more clearly in the schedule so that developers do not try to claim otherwise at VCAT? If so, it would be a much benefit. I also have concerns regarding the same issues mentioned in EGAG's presentation. The increase in levels proposed in precincts three and five are more of concern in some areas than in others, particularly along the western edge of the activity centre. The inclusion of precinct four concerned me, but I have been assured by planners that future development will not be made easier by its inclusion in the AC. I ask that the above concerns be addressed satisfactorily in order to retain the Eltham character we know and love. Thank you. Sorry, thanks Carlotta. Are there any questions of Carlotta? Jeff, or oh, Council Payne, sorry. Um, thanks for that, um, Carlotta. You've spoken to Paul Fife, you've spoken to um, town planners. Do you, would you see that there are reasons to delay this amendment any further beyond the, um, the community consultation that we're about to go into? Sorry, community consultation you're about to go into. Yes, we're, we're putting this out to the community. I guess I'm asking, you'd said that December was not enough time to go to the community for consultation. Has the community had enough time, in your opinion, to look at the plans? You're saying between then and now? Yes, oh. and, and, and given that we're about to go to the community again um, for their um, feedback. I, I, sorry, uh, um, Councillor sorry. Payne, can I clarify for you, Carla? I think what Councillor Payne is saying is, is once it goes to the Minister, there will be more uh, consultation. Is that what you're referring to, Councillor Payne? Pretty much. Yeah, I just thought okay. I'd clarify that. Yeah. Right. Okay. No, I was confused. Um, well, I guess um, the community that I have spoken to, me personally, um, and um, the ECAG people that we have spoken to, or people representing, um, feel that some of these areas would be better dealt with if it was possible um, as coming from council. It's sort of like going like, if council 
um, passes an object, uh, an application, and the planner takes it. Um, sorry, park of council passes it, and the community take it to BCAT. It's not seen given as much weight as if council had seen to refuse it in the first place. So I guess what I'm saying is that for council to put up something um, that seems that is obviously what they think should go through, it would appear to me, this is personally speaking personally, that any objections to it may have less weight because the minister may be saying, well, this is what council think uh, is the what should be happening. Does that make sense? Sorry, I'm not making. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, sorry, Carla, could you just say that again, please? <laughs> sorry. Just the last bit. Well, it, it, may, it may be an ac inaccurate um, perception from my point, um, on my point, but my point of view. <sighs> what I'm trying to say is that if this goes to the minister, the minister will be saying, this is what council wants. So to make changes before it got there may have more weight because that would be seen as what council wants, even if you say, are saying to yourselves, well, okay, perhaps that would be better, but we'll let it go through. It will be seen as if you're saying, no, this is what we think it should be. Okay, I understand that now, thank you. Uh, no other, uh, Councillor Duffy. Thank you. Hi, Carla. Just to expand on what you were talking about, about what council believes should go through, um, do you believe that the community has had adequate consultation opportunity to really know what is being proposed with this um, these amendments? Um, well, look, it was, it was 20, 21, 22 months ago. Um, and presumably, um, well, uh, as I said, be asked in the submission, I don't know what the level of concern about the heights was, if you're talking about the heights. Um, obviously, a lot of people were concerned and put in submissions. Um, I have no idea. I don't know whether that was made clear to, to the community what level of concern there was. Um, I think it's from December till now, um, as I said too, um, it's been, it's a strange time. Um, people aren't uh, focused on council issues at all. Um, I don't, so yeah, certainly, um, yeah, it's just a, not a good time for, for more consultation really, but whether or not you think there should be more and that would be of any benefit, I really can't say. Thank you, Carlotta. I suppose with that question, I'm trying to ascertain um, whether um, consultation to the community, council needs to ensure that we are talking to the community to let them know that this consultation is happening because, you know, over a Christmas period with the pandemic, um, you know, I've received three submissions this afternoon that That's didn't make the deadline of yesterday. And no, no speeches, Councillor Duffy, just a question. Okay, so my question is, um, would it shock you to know that lots of people in our Eltham community have no idea of the height limits that were approved by the previous council in 2020? And do you think that, the, the, that that should be revisited in looking at this plan so that people have got an opportunity to talk about the height limits or just keep pushing this through with what the old council had approved um, that this council accepts? Um, no, it wouldn't shock me at all. Um, I think what I think a lot of people were surprised with that consultation in 2020 um, that the height limits that existed did exist. Um, like the four story, five story had been part of the, um, the activity centre since I'm not sure when 2016, I think maybe. 
Um, so people, uh, I think, um, just saw the four or five stories and didn't realise that there was, that the, these increases were about one story higher. Um, so it was like, oh, it's going to be five stories. I mean, I was against, um, and the Elephant Community Action Group was against um, increases, but realising that some increases are expected by the government. Um, but what was um, increase was perhaps too much. Um, so, um, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Carlotta councillors? If not, thanks very much, Carlotta. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we've got uh, the Eltham District Historical Society and Jim Connor speaking on their behalf. Looks like Jim's walking in the room. Hello, Jim. Thanks, councillors. Thanks very much for the opportunity. I'm speaking as president of the Elton District Historical Society, and then I will also speak on my own behalf. In terms of the Historical Society, our interests uh, relate to all properties within the study area that have heritage overlays or are important to the history of Eltham. We encourage council to acknowledge and respect the history of each of these properties. I'll talk about the Timber Trestle Bridge, the Shillinglaw Trees and the adjacent War Memorial Complex. We encourage council to ensure any future works in the vicinity of the Trestle Bridge do not compromise the historical significance of this iconic structure, which is highly valued by our local community. The bridge is historically, scientifically, aesthetically and socially significant at a state level. The current heritage overlay covers the railway bridge and the surrounding site to a radius of 100 metres most important at 100 metres is critical, and considers the bridge to be historically and technically significant to the Shire of, of Nillenbeck. In respect of the Shillinglaw trees, we maintain an interest in the former Eltham Shire office site at 895 Main Road for its historic connections with the Shillinglaw Cottage. The three Mediterranean cypress trees were originally part of the garden of Shillinglaw Cottage which occupied the site prior to the construction of the Shire offices in the 1960s. We consider the three trees, which are well over hundred years old, are of local heritage significance. These trees represent a navigational beacon between the past, the present and future landscape and the history of the district and are covered by a heritage overlay. In respect to the War Memorial buildings, we maintain a strong interest in this site as a living memorial established from funds raised from within the community by public subscription. Our society is of a form, form, sorry, a firm opinion that the original three Eltham War Memorial buildings, including the entrance gates, should not be sold or demolished. The site should remain in community ownership. The cultural heritage significant assessment undertaken in 2007 for council states, the War Memorial Building Complex at 903 907 Main Road, Eltham, is historically, aesthetically and socially significant to the Shire of Nillimbic. We are concerned that there is a four storey height limit proposed across this site. We therefore ask Nillimbic Council to to respect and value its historically significant property within the study area of the Eltham Activity Centre Structure Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we'll now go to your own submission and then we'll be able to ask you questions after that. Good, thanks very much. So this is a personal submission and not on behalf of any organisation. Having experienced various strategic processes for the town centre going back to the 1980s, there is a repetition of many items from past plans, many of which that haven't actually been implemented. It is important we recognise Eltham is different in so many ways and any structure plans needs to responsibly reflect the wishes, aspirations, expectations 
and the history of those who choose to live and work here. Eltham is not like other metropolitan activity centres. It does not and should not have the development scale of other activity centres. This is not Doncaster. This is not Greensboro. Those centres provide a very different function. We are talking about Eltham with a rare and distinctive style where the natural environment and built form are interwoven. Future strategic approaches need to actively support this style and not attempt to produce a high density commercial and residential development model, as I feel parts of this structure plan are focused on. Buildings need to complement the natural landscape instead of overwhelming it. I encourage architect architecture that is design, designed to be sympathetic to the landscape and the heart, artistic heritage of Eltham, responding to a lower density scale with landscaping ensuring effective provision and maintenance of canopy trees. I don't support discretions for developments to exceed maximum building heights. On page 22 of the original draft structure plan, there was a stated intention to create a lively and people-based center with civic and community spaces that enhance community interaction and general health and well-being, accommodating a wild, wide variety of community functions, including the display of community art and artifacts, which reflect the artistic and cultural aspirations of the community. I totally support that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Are there any questions of Jim, councillors? No, that being the case, thanks very much for your uh, personal submission and also um, as president of the Eltham District Historical Society, Jim. Good, thanks councillor, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, next we have Nicholas Brown. So, Nick Brown uh, is making his way in now. Can you hear us, Nick? Yep. Hang on, we might have some sound problems, Nick. We can't hear you. That's you, better. You That's need people to hear me now? Yes, we've got you. Awesome. When you're ready. Great, look, um, uh, thank you, Mayor and um, Chair and Councillors. Um, I would oppose the proposals because of the height issues. Um, I note that six of you have got backgrounds that show what Nilambic is. It is green fields with tall buildings far away in the mist. And I think that's what attracted most of us to this area when we first came here. And it's what most of us want to retain. I look at Nilambic and I struggle to think of anywhere where a building of more than three storeys would be appropriate. And in fact, to be honest, I can't think of many places where three storeys would be appropriate. This is an opportunity for us to claim the community that we want. Uh, it's an opportunity uh, at the risk of copying Jim to say we are not Greensboro, uh, we are not Rosanna, that we are indeed unique, we are the Green Wedge Shire. Um, and that means that yes, we can have development, but it doesn't mean bigger, it doesn't mean taller, it doesn't mean denser, and it doesn't mean that it covers more land. If we look at Hurstbridge uh, as a very good example of what we could aspire to, uh, that shows that we can develop uh, through quality, uh, not quantity. Um, in terms of what uh, tall buildings would be, um, when the plan was first developed, uh, I believe that was pre-COVID, I could be wrong, um, but uh, I think the world has changed since then, that we're no longer looking at 
uh, people uh, in the same quantities going to work in workplaces. Uh, so I don't believe that a uh, multi-storey development is appropriate for work and it would inevitably be residential. Uh, and we would just be creating a community of blocks of flats and we'd be deluding ourselves if we thought that was going to be cheaper accommodation than is already available. It would just be more of the expensive accommodation uh, that already exists. Uh, indeed, if we look in Diamond Creek, uh, we can see two-storey development in uh, the shopping centre that for most of my time in, in Diamond Creek uh, has been vacant or, or, or very seldom used. I just think this is um, such a missed opportunity for us to go back, say this is this is the Diamond Creek, this is the Eltham that we want, and at the same time uh, we should be putting in a, a housing scheme uh, that defines what it is that we want uh, in our housing, uh, which should be detached dwellings of one to two storeys in the main uh, with plenty of green space in between. This is about uh, preserving the character of the community that we want, not the community that's being imposed upon us. Thank you, Nick. Any questions for Nick, councillors? Uh, Councillor Payne. Uh, Nick, um, what do you think is being imposed on us? Um, I think that there is a general state uh, direction towards growth. I think that there is a um, development corridor in Whittlesea. Um, and the fact that we are next to Whittlesea means that some people are seeing this as an opportunity to uh, blur the boundaries and um, uh, take some of the culture that's from Whittlesea and, and see whether they can uh, bring it into parts of Nilambic. Um, honestly, uh, I, I've, I've seen South Morang, uh, I've seen uh, Mernda. I have friends that live there and it's not what I would wish on anybody. Okay. Dr. Regan. Um, thank you for your submission, Nick. Um, do you realise that you can already build to those heights in Eltham? Sorry? I do didn't... you realise that you can already build to those heights in Eltham? Uh, yes, I do. And um, what we're looking at here is uh, an, an opportunity in revising the scheme to say, do we want to revise it upwards or do we want to revise it downwards? Um, and I think this is an opportunity to revise it downwards. Um, the fact that we don't have four or five storey buildings in Eltham, um, given that you can do that, uh, points to me that there isn't actually the demand for it anyway. Um, so let's actually take the opportunity of, of solidifying that. So do you also realise that part of the reason that this was, um, I suppose, brought about is that the state government expects us to have some sort of development. So staff have put the meagre increases in an area where nobody's going to want to do it. We run the risk, or are you aware that we run the risk of um, a state government coming along and imposing even greater height um, restrictions if we don't if we try and even go down that's that, that that is a risk yes absolutely but at the same time uh, if you believe in um in in democracy if you believe in um local government then uh, we should be trying to get what we want not trying to uh, have somebody tell us that that we must have something that's very awful and we say well let's have something that's slightly less awful um, well that didn't work with the Fitzsimmons roundabout i'll just leave it there thank you Well, good on you, Nick. Thanks very much for your time tonight and thanks for making that, that submission. Uh, so we'll uh, wish you good night. Uh, the next speaker we have is Simone Cusack. If you're there, Simone. Sorry, through the chair, um, Councillor Perkins, we're just um, giving her a call. There might be an issue with the link that was provided, so just... Um, Do you want me to go on to the next, the next one? Esther Caspi has got a... Um, a written statement like if that'll give us some time if you don't yeah. mind okay i'll read that one out that might give you some some chance while we uh listen to esther's submission um esther says i strenuously object to amendment c44 and the planet supports please abandon this structural plan so that it can be re-exhibited in a new process after the finalization of the eminent new housing strategy the housing strategy must come first especially with the current economic and pandemic crisis, whereby new needs and community aspirations may be desired or necessary. It is not acceptable for a 21-year-old housing strategy to inform this structural plan. 
I believe this plan is unfair to all landowners who will be impacted by it, not just those in the activity centre who were notified. It is discriminatory and prejudiced against original Diamond Creek. Businesses in Collins Street and Main Street have been excluded from the structure plan and the study area boundary, both in 2006 and again now, despite being liable for the special rate charge. None of my objections have been incorporated. What have you done to my hometown? You have moved the goalpost so far to the east, I do not recognise it in your Diamond Creek structure plan. You have even taken my old primary school out of the study area and activity centre boundary instead of including both the Diamond Creek East Primary School and Diamond Valley College, in brackets, see maps 2016 and 2020, close brackets. At the very least, they should have been notified in writing. There are other major changes. Uh, there are other major changes, not minor, as has been conveyed. Example, rezoning of industrial areas in precincts three and five to commercial. I had certainty in the well-founded future of Diamond Creek proper and the planned growth in lands to its strategic north, strategic north, in brackets like ours, and invested it accordingly. New potential investors for Shoot Street Precinct 1 are already showing disinterest by saying, you have become the second poor cousin on the wrong side of town. Does council realise the devastating impact the plan will have on all businesses, investors, housing, and landowners on the original town centre of Shoot Street. This plan effectively freezes the future of Shoot Street with an unrecognisable new suburb. It is vital that Shoot Street is rescued as a retail node and that all policies and strategies support this. Diamond Creek Township must remain one whole town with equal attention given to both sides of the creek. And that's, uh, that's Esther's submission. Thank you, Esther. And Simone, have we been, been able to get Simone? Sorry, through the chair, we haven't been able to get a hold of her. Okay, I've got another, I've got one more or two more to read out. They're not all that long, but I'll read them out. Uh, Anthony Young, uh, hi, to whom it may concern. First of all, I've been alerted to Facebook and post shared to Eltham Life 30955 by Natalie Duffy, in brackets, who I've voted for in the most recent elections, close brackets. That was yesterday, the deadline for any response stating concern and objection to the proposed by Monday the 7th, which is next day in uh, shady words like capitals. A couple of exclamation marks there as well. Already that is my very poor, already that is very poor in my view. This has uh, potential to change the face of Eltham and yet you only gave us one day to state our concern. Uh, not good enough, that's shouting. Now I wish to make the following statements to respond to the proposal. There's dot points. The first is our road infrastructure is not there to support the proposal on both Main Street and Bridge Street. Both roads have experienced significant heavy traffic. Parking capacity at the train station is very small already. Before COVID, the car park would be full by 7.30 a.m. already. Car parks were full, of, were full most of the time at the medical clinics in Eltham already. Can't beat progress in brackets, government or business may be driving this proposal, close brackets, but your proposal seems totally excessive. Maybe should be enough to support existing businesses to ensure they're profitable and sustainable, but not create slash add new businesses. We sold our previous house to move out of heavily overdeveloped suburb and intentionally paid over the market premium to move to this beautiful Eltham. So not to face the problem for at least a decade, only to find this going to happen right here. We chose Alpha for mental health reasons and now this. Horrified by Box Hill, Doncaster, Pine Hill, et cetera, as they were ugly and nothing good about it. And you are putting beautiful Alpha at risk of becoming exactly the one that we hated elsewhere in Melbourne. We are nothing like Doncaster, Panton Hill, et cetera, where you can't expect people to ditch cars and walk from homes to shops or train station to work because Alpha is full of hills, making the walks very difficult for some of us. Lastly, we're in the Green Wedge and you are going against that. I say absolutely no to your proposal. Kind regards, your very concerned resident of Altham in, Yet in Anthony Young. Uh, the last uh, submission before we go back to, uh, who was it? Um, Simone, is from Justine Knight. Justine says, I am objecting to the amendments proposed by, proposed to change building heights to greater than three stories in Altham. I do not support towering buildings throughout Altham. Eltham is to keep in its unique setting. If I wanted to live in a suburb of towers, I'd move to Box Hill. 
Why is it hard for people to realise that Eltham is not a place for excessive development and that people have chosen to live here as it's a unique suburb with a beautiful tree canopy? It offers a green, low-stress, low-concrete lifestyle, one that you would normally have to live in the middle of nowhere to enjoy. Please just focus on what makes Eltham, Eltham, and think smarter when progressing Eltham. So thank you, Justine. That's Justine's submission. How do we go, Simone? Through the chair, unfortunately, we haven't been able to contact Simone. Um, yeah. But uh, we do have Gilla still on hold to, oh, to speak to her submission. Yes, yeah, sorry, Gilla. I've almost forgotten about you. Are you there, Gilla? You're on mute, Gilla. I think it was star six. Gilla, I'll give you another couple of seconds, but we're going to have to move on unless you can um, work out how to get yourself off mute. All right, we're going to have to um, continue. Uh, oh, okay. hang on. Oh, that was Daly. Sorry. Yeah, excuse me. I think it's important to let her speak. I remember at the last meeting we had like this, Gilla went to speak and she had technical problems. So are we able to see if she's able to work it out because she did express that at the beginning of the meeting that she wanted to um, have that opportunity. Don't know how much longer you want to give, but I think that that's important. That's fine. It could be two minutes, it could be 20, it could be, you know, we could sit here all night and Gilla might never appear. Um, so I think we do have to move on. Um, although, yep. I'll look for a motion, councillors. Uh, yes, I'm happy to move the motion. Yep, when you're ready, Councillor Payne. I'll just wait for it to come up on screen. So I'd like to move the recommendation that the committee acting under delegation from council notes the verbal presentations to the committee on the item and two, presents the item to the March 2022 council meeting for further consideration. Thank you, Councillor Payne. Do we have a seconder? Uh, Mayor, Mayor Eyre. Thank you, Mayor Eyre. Uh, back to you, Councillor Payne. Um, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Perkins. So um, in speaking to this motion, I, I simply wanted to clarify that there has been a great deal of hysteria generated, I think, in the community uh, over some conspiracy theories about uh, what Council is doing and, um, and who's doing what. And people have their own reasons for this. I think um, in particular cases, some people get an immediate windfall profit if they can subdivide their houses and others are seeking attention. So I'd, I'd like to clarify from my point of view what I think is the story so far. The state government comes up with a planning scheme that says there's an urban growth boundary around the city of Melbourne, which you can see behind half of the council is here. And it says we have major activity centres. And Nilabik, being a small, low growth council, has two. Eltham and Diamond Creek. And the state government says, we do need to concentrate growth inside the urban growth boundary and we'd like it to be close to major activity centres, even small ones like Eltham and Diamond Creek. For that to work, they have to increase the density of the housing. Now, this is a state government planning scheme. This is not something local council can necessarily fight or alter. As we've seen with some of the roadworks around the Shire, there's a limit to what local council can do. 22 months ago, a, uh, a planning scheme was put forward that basically concentrated the height limits to three, four and five storeys. Now, they already exist in the planning scheme. And at the moment, there are no plans for any high rise buildings in the Shire at all. So while people keep talking about the potential for this, we don't have any plans for this because it is a low growth area. And I should remind people that the low growth of Nilambic has not been because necessarily of a, a love of the trees. It's because um, it is simply not part of the growth corridors that Melbourne is experiencing to the north and particularly to the southeast. So um, we've been sitting on this for 22 months. Um, our planners basically negotiated with the state government to have height limits of three, four and five storeys which is some of the strictest height limits anywhere in the state. And they did that on the basis that we don't threaten growth because we don't have that growth. We don't have that high density growth. 
uh, developers are not looking to put up tall buildings in places like Eltham and Diamond Creek. I think it's important that we go into the community and explain and overcome the misinformation that's being spread actively on social media about this and tamp down on some of the hysteria. We've heard some of the, the objectors tonight saying um, they have spoken to the town planners. They've been pleasantly surprised at the level of threat, which doesn't exist here. And uh, we've also had people explain that they've never seen some of the shopping centres actually full, and it's because we don't have that latent pressure for development here. So the suggestions being that council officers were trying to slip something through before Christmas. Um, in fact, we've come back out, we've delayed this so that people can actually make their comments. And the, the other thing I'd like to point out is that these amendments by joining the um, activity centre zone to Eltham zone, it means that the Bridge Street business area where places like Bunnings have been able to develop uh, uncontested will change. For the first time, we will have controls that can actually have setbacks, reduce the size and built form of some of the buildings in that Bridge Street business area. And that's controls that we don't have at the moment because it's an industrial zone and it's simply a land use zone, not urban design. So I just wanted to um, encourage people to have a look at this and to understand that we don't have the pressure for high rise, that it's been concentrated basically around the train station, which is on the lower part of the hill in Eltham. And I would look forward to people explaining um, what, what they see as a vision for Eltham and understand that as councillors, we share that vision for Eltham. We don't have property consultants on council anymore. We have people who want this place to remain as is and working within the state planning guidelines. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, Councillor Payne. Uh, Mayor Eyre, did you want to wish to speak? Yes, thank you, Councillor Perkins. Um, I've just got some things to read out and I'm reading it out because I know that um, planning is quite complex. But firstly, I just wanted to say that I've been uh, contacted by many concerned residents around the Heights, around uh, the consultation that has happened over this last um, period since we deferred from December, and also around the idea that they want to be able to downsize in Nillambic and um, have somewhere to live and stay here. And so therefore they were welcoming some of these changes. Um, so, uh, so far uh, this process has taken over 20 months to get to where we are. A lot of officer time, money and consultation. Um, and that was with the previous council. But I wanted to talk about the next stages in the amendment process, subject to council resolution and seeking authorization um, from the minister. Uh, who will exhibit the amendment upon um, uh, the Minister's uh, authorisation. And noting that this whole process could take another 18 months or up to 18 months. Um, so the first point is, is to seek Minister's authorisation to prepare the amendment. Then it would go uh, subject to the Minister's authorisation, exhibit the amendment with associated communications, which includes written notification to those affected by the amendment, which is owners, occupiers in the ACZ and adjoining parcels. Uh, things like participate Nillambic, notice in the Government Gazette, uh, newspapers and uh, social media. Then it would go to a notification, um, uh, which is a minimum of one calendar month as per the requirements of the Planning and Environment Act. Then we would move to a briefing to council, which comes to us and we hear about um, any of the feedback, which then feeds into a PCC meeting such as tonight, where we hear submissions to the amendment. Um, council then um, meets to seek approval. Uh, so council meeting, so it goes to a council meeting to seek approval um, uh, and uh, to approve and to convene an independent panel to hear submissions and give um, council recommendations if there are any objections, which there could be. Uh, then there will be a panel hearing where submission, uh, submitters can make um, further submissions. And I just ask if, um, if I run out of time, if I could have a little bit additional time, I think it's important to go through this process. Um, council briefing, again, council meeting um, uh, to make changements to the amendment or not and send to the minister for uh, consideration and approval. So then once it goes to the minister, there can be considerable time for assessment. Then it could be approved or refused. And then if approved, 
Uh, the planning scheme is updated with the new controls as per the 2020 structure plans. Um, but we also need to take on board the feedback we've received tonight, and I'll do my best to change where possible um, uh, anything that can before it goes to the minister, including um, heights, um, and to note that some were already in place and others in Bridge Street had no height limits at all. So by pushing this through at this point, at least we're protecting some areas um, such as Bridge Street. Um, uh, and as been mentioned, some um, increases are expected by government. Um, and yes, as I mentioned, also around residents uh, wanting to downsize in the Olympic, which is really important um, to consider as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Eyre. Uh, any other council wishing to speak to the motion or against the motion? More specifically, Councillor Duffy. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, whilst the Eltham and Diamond Creek major activity structure plans have been top of mind for council officers for quite some time and the previous council, I don't believe that our Nilibit community has had the same luxury um, with a sense of awareness of what these structure plans entail, nor do they feel that they've had adequate community consultation. We've heard from Jim Connor tonight that Eltham is not like other activity centres. It's rare and distinctive. Um, buildings need to be sympathetic to the landscape and to not overwhelm it. We heard from Nick Brown, who interestingly said, if you believe in democracy, if you believe in local government, and he challenged us to say, we can put forward to the state government what we want, I'm paraphrasing, we, what we want and what we believe for our community. And if our community don't want um, height increases in Eltham, we shouldn't just put it through because we think the state government wants that. Now, I understand now that as a councillor, that Eltham has heights in the town centre of three and five storeys, and, you know, that's not new, but that in 2020, the previous council voted to increase these limits in some areas, particularly around the train station and along Youth Road. We heard submitters talk about that tonight. The areas that were three-storey areas are now four-storey. Areas that were four storeys are now five storeys, and there's also discretionary limits, so that can go higher. There are some good things that have happened in this plan, and we've heard that talked about as well with setbacks. But these Eltham height increases were adopted by the previous council in 2020, despite then, at the time, the Edendale Ward Councillor and Councillor Peter Perkins requesting to the old council that additional time be given before a decision was made. That was denied. On a whim, additional time was provided to the Diamond Creek community for, and for the Diamond Creek plan, which resulted in no increases in their heights. So for me, meaningful community consultation and transparency is important. It's not just to me, but it's also important to, um, as to the people that we represent as councillors. Like now, back in 2020, there was no local paper available at the time that these planning controls um, went through. It, people didn't know what was going on then, and they still don't know the details of it now. Hearing that a sense of hysteria has come when people don't know what's going on and don't feel that they've been given a chance to express their view for consideration is true. In good conscience, I could not come to this meeting to hear the community, hear from the community, the small number of people that submitted tonight, knowing that council hadn't really gone to much effort to let people know that they were even invited to be able to talk tonight. The December meeting transferred um, a decision to tonight to hear people speak, but we as a council didn't even advertise to the community that they had that opportunity to come and speak. Not one Facebook post was sent out specifically on this matter, which is setting up the next 10 year framework. And Councillor Payne has indirectly accused me of misinformation on social media. I simply put on social media um, copies of the amendment of the maps that are in this plan so that people know what's being changed. That's not misinformation. I haven't created hysteria. I have That's just tried lucky. to help people. You're Sorry if I could just finish this one point. No. I've just right. tried. Yes, please. Time. No. You would let the mayor finish her point. I think this is important. It's one more sentence, if that's okay, Chair. All right, you'll back off Councillor Payne for the moment. Yeah, I'm not going to say anything about Councillor Payne. I'm right. wanting to say, what is the point of encouraging people to have a look at what we're doing when our council isn't willing to let them know that we're doing it in the first place? I think this is a communication and, um, a, you know, a, an improvement is needed for us to be able to ensure that the next step, so if we're to 
go to the minister and tell the community that it's okay, you've got another chance to say something and share your views, Will, do they really have a chance to change things? Or does Thank that you, stop Councillor with us Duffy. now? You're now a minute over. Councillor Stockman. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, it's my first words this uh, this evening, but I uh, just wanted to um, sort of go, go with um, Councillor Duffy there and actually say that uh, after last year, I actually was going to go with this motion and um, uh, stamp it last year. I could have done that in December last week. I would have done the same thing, and this morning I would have done the same thing. But after hearing the um, submitters and hearing a little bit more going out to consultation, something that I'm all about, and I've um, there's definitely something in there for me that, that this needs to be a little bit more consultation in it. I, I think there's, uh, we've seen some people talk um, today and present um, some really good arguments, and so I've had a, a good listen to them. Um, I just wanted to mention, only because this sort of brings up something from um, last year as well, an important topic was um, the community hospital, and we talked about conspiracy theories, and there was the five-storey-plus hospital uh, going in into a certain ward, and there was going to be all sorts of different things there. So I... Uh, uh, I know even on the day before we made that decision, there was sort of terrified residents thinking there's going to be people shooting up in the street and so forth. So I just thought that, um, you know, you're always going to have those uh, different um, elements of what people think. But I don't know if, look, this is a conspiracy theory. The, the, the fact is, is that um, there is uh, an increase in height, whichever way you want to look at it, there is going to be an increase in height um, in some areas. So um, I, I won't be um, supporting this motion as well. Thanks, Councillor Stockman. Uh, any other councillor hasn't spoken? Councillor Ranfran. Yeah, look, I'm not going to um, take up too much time. Um, I just wanted to, to remind everyone that if we don't go ahead with this as it is, it will take another three years and a lot of money to get back here. And during those three years, we will have areas of Eltham that don't have these planning controls on them that really need them. Um, for example, if you look at the Bridge Street Precinct, which in the new... Um, in the, in the, this new proposal, we'll have an activity centre zone on it with controls that will really put it in a, in a proper direction rather than this sort of piecemeal development that we're getting that's thrown the area into something that we, you know, maybe, we, we, maybe it could be better. And it would be better if we had proper planning controls on it. So that's what we could be delaying if, if we don't go ahead with this as is. We can make minor changes, uh, but I don't think that... It, it's worth delaying this process in order to make major changes when that will have significant disadvantages for other areas of Altham. Um, I do acknowledge that height limits are going up ever so slightly in one very small section in an area where there's no commercial or economic pressure to actually build buildings of that height. But what that does is it means we're much more likely to get this past the Minister for Planning. And that's the really difficult tightrope that we have to walk as a council between having something that we're really, really happy with versus having something that the Minister for Planning is actually going to approve and put in our planning scheme so that our areas are protected. So I, I, I do think that those very slight increases in height in some limited areas around the train station are justified in order to achieve that. And I think having, uh, having today, we've, we've pushed, pushed this back to February. Remember, this was on the agenda for our December meeting. We've pushed it back to February to give people a chance to speak. And we've had a number of speakers here tonight. I, I really think we have done our job in terms of community consultation, especially given that that is on the back of a lot of community consultation in previous years to put this, the structure plans together and further consultation that will be happening as part of the planning scheme and the process. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Entry. Any other council wishing to speak? Um, look, I'll, I'll just say, just, you know, drawing reference to what the actual motion is, and it's, you know, it's a simple motion to note the verbal presentations to the committee um, and to present the item to the next council meeting. Uh, it's not a contentious motion. Uh, you know, we council can have, have discussions about itself for the next two weeks. Um, you know, I was hoping by deferring uh, this item from last December, we could make um, some minor tweaks. I was, I was conscious that, uh, you know, not then and not now do I want to go back and revisit um, the structure plans and start again. I don't think that's um, really, really tenable for a, a number of reasons. Um, but, you know, in terms of clarity and, and having more time for us and the residents to ask, ask questions and have 
uh, many of those those things clarified, I think is, has been valuable. So I'm happy to support uh, the motion. Uh, Councillor Duffy talked about the process uh, in the last council and described um, a whim where I managed to uh, uh, avoid any increase in height in Diamond Creek. I can I can guarantee you, Councillor Duffy, it wasn't wasn't a whim. Um, there was a lot of hard work uh, behind uh, that achievement. I wasn't able to achieve the same thing in in, in uh, Eltham because of uh, the makeup of the council, but I, I did manage to get majority support for not increasing height uh, in Diamond Creek. And it's a, an achievement that I am proud of. And, and, and I certainly understand if other councillors uh, want to mirror that process, but I think it's too late, uh, to be honest, uh, because the structure plan has been endorsed and that was endorsed um, 2020. Uh, you know, it, it's just the nature of, of, uh, of the process. Um, Unfortunately, and but you know certainly the, the minor changes that um, need to be incorporated are really just clarifying some of the, the items in there. Look, you know I can even look at the, the attachments to the, the meeting tonight, and and it's almost like the the more important the document, the smaller the writing gets to the, the point where you can't read it. And 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 the maps as presented are illegible, and, and most of the writing is even with the, the magnifying glass, um, you can't actually read it. And uh, you know the, the electronic versions that that we've been provided with often are, are no better. Uh, but, um, you know, certainly we've had some discussions with, with the planners um, and, you know, I'll be seeking to ensure that those maps are as large and as clear and as concise um, as can possibly be so, so everybody can, um, can fully understand uh, what, is, what is proposed and what's not because there is a bit of confusion out there. Uh, but happy to support the motion uh, myself. I'll put the motion to a vote. All those in favour? And against? I just have a, a clarification. Um, so the motion today is just to bring it to the next council meeting. Is that correct? Uh, um, the, the motion, the motion uh, I'll read it out for you. It, it notes the presentations and presents the item in the March 22 OCM. I'm wondering whether there is an opportunity for people to speak at the March um, planning and consultation Duffy, meeting. I put, the, I put the motion to the vote. You interrupted the vote. You're out of order. I'm Sorry. going to vote, vote again. All those in favour of the motion? And against? The motion's carried. Now we'll move on to the next item. That's the municipal planning strategy, strategy phase two consultation. Uh, looking, uh, actually, I'll see what, I don't think we have any, any submitters. Oh, we do actually. Um, we've, got, we've got three submitters in person uh, and that looks to be it. Um, the first is Gilla Schnapp on the phone via Zoom, uh, Municipal Planning Strategy Phase Two Consultation. Are you there, Gilla? Yes, I'm here. Good, yes, good to hear I'm you, here. Gilla. Yes, Peter. I want to, Esther Caspi has also registered. Can you please make sure she gets in? If yep. you cannot get, if you can't get in for some reason, like what happened to me before in my personal submission, then I've got permission from her and I've told council I've got a copy of her submission and I will read out if that happens, um, her submission. All I right, so just, rushed... just so you know, the order, there's only three submissions and, and Gilla, you're first and then Esther okay. and then Bridget Billy at the end. Okay, that's fine, but I couldn't get in before and I will be putting in a written submission because the issues I had were very, very important, including council not following proper process. Well, we waited and waited uh, for you, but we had to move on. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but yeah, we'll, we'll receive your, your written submission. I had, sure. that's right. I, had, yes, that. I had two telephones, neither of them working. Okay. Right. Um, of all contents of my submissions that you already have, with all the hard evidence, the legal support letters, the town planning support letters, and the engineering letters supporting our claims from one of Melbourne's top professionals. Uh, you've got, you have a copy of that under your con confidential submission, all that information that's also gone to the parliamentary inquiry as we're finding we can't get justice and no one's taking notice of our hard evidence, serious hard evidence that we were urban with urban articulate infrastructure. Therefore, all the contents of my, of my submission, and I'm also talking 
um, on behalf of 40 to so Pioneer Road, family Pioneer Road properties and, and, and an acreage property, um, half a kilometre of road frontage. All right. All contents within urban infrastructure, all contents are directly relevant to this new MPS, the Local Planning Policy Framework, the LPPF Framework and the new Melbourne State Planning Policy Framework. The scope, scope, terms of reference, purview and other cannot be used as an excuse to disqualify any part of our submissions as appears to be the case by the officer's report. These policies must be based on a correct planning foundation. Okay, am I being heard? Oh, yes. Yep. Okay. okay. We plead with Nilla Big Shire Council to assist us in the course and cause of justice by ensuring our lands and in opinion others like ours entitled are included rightfully and equitably as, res as part of residential in the suburb of Diamond Creek and included rightfully within Melbourne's new metropolitan urban boundary. This is irrespective of any final site specific land use. The outstanding zoning and mapping mistakes from our lands continually drawn, continually drawn to the attention of council and others must be corrected as a high priority together with other like lands in Diamond Creek and Yarrabat. This is to ensure there is no impact whatsoever on our lands by Council's new MPS. Value to do so will mean this strategy and Council's planning scheme will be seriously continued to be flawed with an unacceptable, incorrect foundation. The 2000-2001, when planning mistakes and anomalies irregularities for our lands were first made, we lobbied the then infrastructure sector of Premier and Cabinet. Shortly afterwards, Premier Steve Brax issued a direction to Nunavik Shire Council stating that land with infrastructure was to be released with metropolitan strategy and Green Wedge was not to be used as an excuse to fail to do so. We remain mystified as to why this did not occur with our lands. We question if others have also been included, have been, and others have been included in some way behind the scenes for future while we have been inequally and unfairly excluded. If at any point of time these lands were planned differently to like lands with mandatory urban particular infrastructure, be it by mistake, jealousy, discrimination, financial advantage or any other reason, then the owners were not notified and proper process was not followed. Hey, okay, Gillard, that's what, your, your time is up. Are, are, you, are you still available to answer some questions? Um, yes, yeah, sure. All right, we'll see if there's any questions. Uh, councillors, any questions, Aguilar? Uh, Councillor Payne. Hey, Gillar, it's uh, Jeff Payne here. Can Hi, you hear sir. me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Thank you. Um, you you're asking a local councillor to or council to correct the urban growth boundary. Is that right? Indirectly, I'm asking you to notify the minister because you have the hard evidence and you have the ability to notify the planning minister directly as it appears he has been seriously informed and is not aware that we have in, um, urban reticulated infrastructure and we, our lands were, were mandatory paid the most in that urban district having the highest residential land use and the most capability. Um, now, Aguilar, uh, Aguilar, I'm sorry, but, but have you been asking the same question for 20 years of different councillors on this no, council? No actually, no, actually, not quite. What has been happening is it's been very, very, um, it's been very discriminatory that council have not allowed us, in fact, um, Many of the councillors I have not spoke with, none of our family have been spoken to them since they've been in council, nor we have, have we have been able to speak or lobby them. But we have given you town planning legal, uh, town planning legal letters, uh, the solicitor's letters and town planning legal yep. and engineering. Thanks, Gilla. That's, that's good. It's Thank you. No, that's good. That's, that's answered everything I've asked. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, are there any other councillors wishing to ask a question of Gilla? No. Thank you very much, Gillard. Thanks for your submission. We'll come back to you. Ask My hand was up, um, Chair. Oh, sorry. Councillor Duffy. Uh, thank you. It's just following on from um, the question that was just raised. So, Gillard, um, you've asked Council to do this before and, ha and Council has said no or Council has said yes? Yes. No, can Council actually, it's a bit hard to explain in a few minutes, they haven't really 
lobbied the minister directly on our, on our behalf, telling him there's something very seriously wrong, in fact, a major scandal, that our situation that is known by council, knowing it is not being protected, our infrastructure is not being protected, you would not, you, it's impossible to have the level of infrastructure we had and be rural land or be excluded in a green wedge, in the green wedge, when we should be included as part of metropolitan Melbourne. And in fact, we had a major victory. And the Ele Victorian Electoral Commission has now put, for everyone's knowledge, has now put Diamond Creek back as a metropolitan suburb for the Legislative Assembly and the Legislative Council based in our submission. So our, our, our case has now been recognised, it's been heard. We were the only ones for Nillimbic and we have 100% of the credit for getting all of Diamond Creek, the whole of Diamond Creek, it was going to be split, all of it is now going to be having new representation as part of the metropolitan suburb of Melbourne. It's now in Alston. We would have preferred the name to be changed to reflect the history of Diamond Valley. That didn't happen, at least in metropolitan Melbourne. We also have been taken out of Mildura, Bendigo, um, Ballar Bendigo, um, the border of New South Wales for upper house representatives and all of Diamond Creek can be pleased to know that now their five representatives will be that of Metropolitan Melbourne who will understand their issues. Now we are hoping um, that if the Victorian Electoral Commission have done the right thing... Laura, I, think, I, think we're drifting, I think we're just drifting to, off track. Just, just to go back onto Tracula with what Council can do, um, yes. would you be happy if Council wrote a letter to the State Government dot pointing the history? And would you accept yep. whatever the state government comes back to to say this is the outcome, knowing that this is not something council can influence? Would no, you I cannot, happy if council I, wrote for you and I can, you accepted the council? Sure. Sorry to interrupt. It's a very emotional, um, emotional question to ask us. We very we've been shattered emotionally in, in every way. Our family have been destroyed by not only what's happened to us, but the discreditation that council officers and others are doing so that our case won't be, won't be believed. And you've got the legal, all the councillors have the legal, rep, legal letters. We expect them to read them and not, not say they didn't read them, they didn't know. They have a responsibility actually to notify, to go above the planning minister and notify the Premier of Victoria with our evidence to make sure that the Premier of Victoria knows really what's happened to this family, which has been shocking, unprecedented, I believe, not just in Victoria. Okay, Gilla, thank you. I think that brings question time to a close. Okay, uh, thank you, Nat. Thank I you very much. Like that, with Is, our cooperation. Uh, well, but no well, well, we'll see. Uh, Esther, we'll, we'll move on to Esther, Gilla, and come back to you if, if Esther's you. with us. Okay. Thank you. Are you here, thank Esther? You. She may be here. Hi. Is that Esther? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And thank you for allowing me to speak. It's my personal submission. I reserve all my rights. Um, it appears to me the MPS has ignored the old timers like our family whom have had associated accrued rights um, over many years from the original suburb of Diamond Creek and its original shopping centre, Precinct 1, and its planned growth from there. Example, the wide bitumen um, from the 1970s established arterial ironbark road, which our properties um, are but, and which I am a stakeholder of for many, many dec decades. Uh, with, known, uh, with known distinctive established infrastructure acknowledged by Council in 1999 and year 2000. For goodness sake, it hurts those years and years of sacrifice and hardship of, of myself and extended family and others in like situations. Holidays and fancy cars were not for me. More important was the future was secure, particularly for my family members, those that, who couldn't protect themselves. Nilibic Shire Council, what have you done to this progress certainty? It appears you have given it away to others, sending us backwards, effectively freezing us in, and, and, and the neighbouring lands likewise. 
I would believe there may be legal ramifications for Nilibic Shire Council. You know how to correct it without excuses continually. This new MPS is not relevant to us. This new MPS must begin a fresh start from scratch and cease railroading our and others' accrued rights with continual new Boa constricting rules and regulations and laws, effectively wiping us off so disrespectfully, I believe, and, and, and that we don't count at all. You have abundant information, evidence, professional backup, continually tabled over, over the years, and again and again and again, like broken records, and and um, we are mocked instead of being looked after. The first MSS should now be respected. Sorry, the first MSS should have respected and acknowledged the historic, established planning and coordinated urban infrastructure for the whole of the original suburb of Diamond Creek and Plenty and Yarrambat Urban District and complement it with your new community green wedge and other, uh, uh, other community aspirations. So please do so now. Also please notify all those responsible for the interrelated new Metropolitan Land Use Framework Plan. Let's move forward together in cohesion, Nilibig Shire Council. Okay, thank but you. Yes, that, that's your, your time is up. Times. Yeah. Thank what you. About, about, we'll ask some questions. You. Might have some questions if you could hang about, Esther. Any questions, councillors? No, there's not Esther. Sorry. Uh, and we're back Thank to Gila. You. Good night. Uh, oh, Gila. Oh, can I, uh, yes. Yes. Do you want to ask me some more questions? No, Gila. You've got. Have you got a, a submission on behalf of Agent Billy Proprietary Limited? Uh, I have. I have. I have been read off the cuff, basic that we would like council to notify the premier because something is very wrong. The, the planning minister may not be briefed properly by his department or by council, and the planning department minister's department has has told us that they need permission that they will go back to council if there's going to be any planning scheme amendment. And therefore, we need to work together. This company, the company needs to work together with council in representation made to the Premier. And it, it, it is not a matter of us then accepting what the Premier or the planning minister says, because we wish to leave, we reserve all our rights and wish, wish to go to the highest level of the land, have already noted the governor, have already sent information to the governor of Victoria. We have already sent all the information you have on our MPS, all the hard evidence you had, and to other submissions to member council. That has all been forwarded and has been continuing to be forwarded to the parliamentary inquiry on planning, which is in progress now. So please, we ask to work with council together instead of happy to have inquiries and and um, and very other traumatic things happen before we can get justice. Please give us justice. Please look at our evidence. Please don't try to discount it. Please understand that one of those pieces of evidence, we have been hard evidence, we have been informed professionally is enough to be able to work back work with work work backwards and proves our case indis indisputably that we are urban, that we are not rural, we do not belong in the Green Wedge. And if you leave us there, we're going to be stripped from our infrastructure and revert back 80 years ago to infrastructure stripped rural bush blocks, less in capability, comparatively less in capability and land use than that of 80 years ago. Nobody would accept that. And that, that is basically what the company has to, has, has to say. And I didn't, couldn't find their submission in front of me in my stress. But you have our submissions. You have the submissions from the company. You have the evidence for the company for three adjoining properties with dual supply of urban reticulated infrastructure. Thank Sorry you, Gil. No, 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 that's, that's, that's very, that's our that's last... last um, you know, we'll add our last resort now. Other than this, we are, we have to go public to the press, to the TV stations. But we ask that this council 
work with us and then not later be embarrassed that they took no notice of our serious case and instead try to muffle us and silence, silence, silence us from this going out to the public. And that is why we've asked for the structure plan to be re-exhibited where I wasn't allowed to be able, I wasn't let in to be able to speak. It must be re-exhibited for all of those in the original Diamond Creek that have accrued rights and they must have the security that this plan is not actually removing their accrued rights with the removal of Diamond Creek as a retail node and the removal of the primary school, which is a marker one of the last markers left that it's an original township. And that, that I believe, is very, very serious. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Gillard. Thanks. I'm sure um, that's very good off the cuff. I'm sure the company would be very happy with that submission. Uh, that, Thank, that includes... thanks, everyone. Thank you for everyone thanks, for listening. Everyone. Have a good night. Yeah, if the, yeah, if the, just one more last point. If the councillors, and most of them won't, except for a few very special ones that we would we will nominate for Queen's Award because they didn't listen to gossip and they and they gave us the time to at least hear us, but would not have but would be very difficult to get anywhere because the majority of the councillors do not answer our letters, have not answered our letters, we've never spoken to them ever. Um, some of them that are in the last council and certainly not this year. So it puts us in a very, very traumatic situation that we need justice. We've had to go public with this today because we cannot get justice and we cannot get help for our councillors as a whole. And okay, all right. That they have a right to, to look at our, well, thanks. our evidence. Thanks so much for your time, Gilla, and good night. Uh, now, Thank look you. for a motion. Look. Yep. Uh, look for it looking for a motion. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Entran. Yes, I'd like to move that the committee acting under delegation from Council 1 notes the public response as outlined in this report to the second phase of consultation for the Municipal Planning Strategy Project. Two, resolves that the confidential unredacted copies of written submissions and survey responses to the exhibition of public engagement for the MPS phase two consultation and attachments three and four remains confidential on the ground specified in the definition of confidential information in the Local Government Act. Three, notes that the first draft of the new MPS is scheduled to be presented to the May Council meeting with a recommendation for Council to endorse it for public engagement and four, rights to all respondents to the community engagement to express Council's gratitude for their contribution and to advise them of the committee's resolution and the next steps in the project. Thank you, Councillor Amtran. Do we have a seconder? I'm happy to second. Thanks, Councillor Payne. Councillor Amtran, do you wish to speak? Yeah, look, this, this document is um, to many quite dull and boring, but it's actually one of the most important parts of our planning scheme and I, I am really pleased to be on a council that is uh, tasked with the responsibility of writing this. This document will set the vision for planning in Nolanbic for many, many years to come. It's not a part of the planning scheme that you get the chance to change very often. So we're very privileged to have that chance. Um, and I, I, I intend to, to be fully involved in the drafting and I look forward to seeing what that draft looks like. We've had a huge amount of input from the community uh, more than you can read in one day, as I found out the hard way. Um, a, lot of, a lot of different input from different people, uh, different perspectives. Many of the submissions were completely opposed to each other, but I think what really shone through more than anything else is that people love living in Nolanbic for our green wedge, our bush, our leafy urban areas, um, and the strict planning controls we have that for many, um, many people feel that they're a burden, but for the vast majority of us, they protect the area where we live and they are the reason that we can we can love this area how, how we do. We really do live in a special area here in Nolanbic. So there's a lot that needs to go into that MPS to make sure that we can continue to protect Nolanbic to the best of our abilities going forwards. Um, and I think we need to really take that community consultation on board and make sure that it's reflected in that MPS. Uh, so, look, I, I would go into details on, on what we heard from the community and what I'd like to see in there, but I would be talking all day. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to seeing the draft when it comes to our council meeting in May. Thanks, Councillor Rantran. Uh, Councillor Payne? Just wanted to reiterate uh, Councillor Rantran's uh, comments about thanking 
council officers, particularly uh, Rosa's as well as and Lee Northwood and all the council officers who worked in this extensive kind of consultation harvesting exercise. It was a lot to read. And I would also like to thank everyone that did put in um, a response and answered this. Um, there are views that I don't necessarily share, but I appreciate people bothering to actually write it down and express what they think is important to them. And I have taken that on board. It's important to actually read things that challenge you. And, and uh, this has been terrific as a way of finding out more about the community and those parts of the community we don't normally hear from. So once again, we'd like to thank everyone that contributed in terms of consultation and the officers for putting this giant piece of structure together. Thank you, Councillor Payne. Any councillor wishing to speak against the motion, first of all, and then any other councillor? So no one wishing to speak against the motion? Any other councillor wishing to speak? Councillor Duffy. Uh, thank you. Um, I note that there have been a total of 458 submissions. Um, 424 surveys were responded to through um, the online uh, survey and 34 were written. I think that's great to be able to get a number of people to respond. The difficulty is always letting people know that this is available for comment and it does form our future. Um, I'd just like to leave with saying that I loved reading through the submissions and I just want to read out something from one of the submissions that I think really hits the mark. Um, Nilambit plays a major role in Metro Melbourne as an accessible area of natural landscape beauty, particularly in these hard times of rolling lockdowns. This natural environment is a significant reason why my family and I chose to live and work in Nilambit. This submitter goes on further to talk about a possible um, municipal planning vision, strategy vision and states that it could be, an overarching statement could be borrowed from elsewhere and they're suggesting in 2040, Nilambik is a national leader in biodiversity protection and reinvigoration, community stewardship of the environment, climate change mitigation and adaptation, sustainable urban design and living, community inclusiveness, equity and connection with a focus on its First Nations people, community participation in the arts and celebration of its culture, uh, its cultural heritage. I think this is why we want to hear the voices of the people in the community, because they have some pearls of wisdom to share with us. So council doesn't need to do this on its own. And so by having community consultation where we do listen and we do incorporate what we hear becomes very important in being able to provide documents and strategies that mirror the wish of the majority of people. Um, I'm really glad to know that people feel that they've had a say with this. Um, I wish that that was the case with all of the community consultation opportunities that the community had, that they knew that they were being invited to provide comment. And it does stress me to hear that we have members in our community, like we've heard from um, two members today who are very stressed about being in the community and how they feel that they've um, you know, had to battle with their situation. So I would really like to um, see if council can help work with them to write the letter um, that they're seeking be written. Um, and we let the government decide, you know, what the outcome of that is, seeing as it's not a council, um, a council decision that they're asking us to help with them. I'm tongue tied, probably should have written that down, but it came off the cuff. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Duffy. Any other councillor? That being the case, um, yeah, I'd just like to thank the submitters as well. Um, certainly uh, lots of engagement. Look forward to the uh, report in May. Uh, we'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? And uh, it's unanimous or unanimously carried. Thank you, councillors. Um, the next item is planning scheme amendment C140, Neil. Exhibition submissions. There are no uh, registra registration requests in relation to this item, so no speakers. Um, so we can move straight to a motion. Looking for a motion. Councillor Regan. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Um, yes, so I'd like to put a motion forward that the committee acting under delegation from Council One notes the submission and any late submissions that may be received to Amendment C140 NIL to the Nellenbeck Planning Scheme. Two, Resolves that the confidential unredacted copy of the written submission to the exhibition of the amendment attachment 
two remains confidential on the grounds specified in the definition of confidential information in Section 3, etc., of the Local Government Act 2020. Three, considers a further report at the February Council meeting to resolve to either A, request the Minister for Planning approve the amendment, or B, appoint an independent planning panel to consider amendment C140 mil, or C, abandon the amendment. Four, request that officers notify submitters to amendment C140 nil of the committee's resolution. And five, request that officers provide an update on to participate in Olympic in regard to next stages, stages for amendment C140 nil. Sorry, thank you, Councillor Egan. Do we have a second? Happy to second. Councillor Payne, thank you. Back to you, Councillor Egan. Thanks, Councillor Payne. Um, yes, at this stage, this is really just um, a formality, really. Um, we need to get a lot more information together. I've seen some, some of the plans for the um, house that's led to this being sort of brought forward. So at the moment, it's really, you know, getting together all the information and we'll go from there. Um, yeah, I don't have enough information at, at the moment to actually comment on this, except that, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Councillor Perkins. Councillor Payne? No comment from me. Okay, any councillor wishing to speak against the motion? Or any other councillor wishing to speak? Um, look, you know, the, the report really is, is to listen to submissions tonight and uh, to note uh, the one submission, uh, very brief submission, uh, that was lodged in support of the amendment. Uh, so, yeah, certainly support the motion uh, as put by Councillor Egan. So I'll now put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? And it's carried unanimously. Thank you. And on to the, the last uh, item for the night. It's uh, uh, item 522, uh, buildings and works to construct an outbuilding, gates, removal of vegetation, and Associated Earthworks at 56 Katani Boulevard, Bend Bowles. Uh, this item was called in by the Ward Councillor, uh, Councillor Ramtran. Uh, we do have three submissions, two in person and, and one that I'll read out. The first uh, person to speak, and, and thanks for your patience, Michael, is, is Michael Dempsey on behalf of uh, BICA. So Ben Bowles, yeah, uh, not quite sure. Uh, Michael can elaborate that that for us. Uh, so over you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I'm speaking on behalf of Bicker, which is a Bend of Islands Conservation Association. Uh, Bicker represents 70% of landowners within the Bend of Islands. Uh, in the draft climate action plan, which was mentioned tonight, one of the recommendations was to improve understanding on local biodiversity and provide specific vegetation, biodiversity and canopy cover targets or indicators. I need to let you know that or make you aware that Bicker has been monitoring the biodiversity and flora and fauna within the Bend of Islands for decades. An example of this is the Bicker Bird Survey, which has over 30 years of cumulative records that includes some threatened species. Now, the SUZ2 is there to preserve the integrity of the diversity of our native flora and fauna within the Bend of Islands. And this planning proposal conflicts with the principles and provisions of the SUZ2, where it states, not more than 25% or 2,000 square metres of an allotment shall be cleared for the purpose of a house, outbuilding or any other development and the above uses shall be grouped and arranged as close as possible into a site development envelope having regard to the natural landscape of the site. This site already has an existing dwelling shed and other structures on the plants which are close to one another and could be repurposed for the desired outcome. But the proposed shed is 65 metres from the dwelling and with an intended 10 metre modified vegetation zone, which will greatly expand the development envelope. This proposal fails to meet the provisions and it should be rejected. The SUZ2 also states, all development shall be designed and constructed to blend into the natural environment and have minimal visual impact with respect to the building siting and form. The proposal is a large shed typical of farming properties and completely out of character with the structures within the Bend of Islands. Once again, this proposal fails to meet this provision and it should be rejected. And the planning scheme states, all buildings must be set back 20 metres in the frontage from all side boundaries. 
A setback on the road, in this case of the proposal, contravenes a 20 metre setback uh, at 14 metres. Once again, it fails and it should be rejected. The proposal for four gates also contravenes the SUZ2 that states that the restrictions on fencing are designed in part to minimise the visual impact and four gates at the top of the narrow property are not an attempt to minimise the visual impact. Additionally, if the purpose of this shed is stated for storage of firefighting equipment, then why is it placed 65 metres away from the main residence? The addition of four gates will also inhibit access by emergency vehicles in times of need. Once again, the SUZ2 is there to preserve the integrity of the diversity of our native flora and fauna within the Bend of Islands. And the key provisions of the SUZ2 are not met by this proposal and it should be rejected. There are alternatives open to the applicant to recite this proposed shed, reduce the development envelope and reduce the visual impact of the structure. That's my objection, thank you. Thanks very much, Michael, and well-timed. Um, I have a question for, from Councillor Egan. Thanks, Michael, for your submission. Um, just a question. So if the gates were removed and the, the site coverage reduced or the area reduced and it was moved closer to the house, would you still have objections? Uh, not, not at all. If it, uh, There is actually another shed which is closer to the house which could be repurposed perfectly for uh, the desired outcome. So why do you have an issue with those gates and yet, uh, you know, I've got friends that live in um, Bender Biles and they've got heaps of gates. Why, why are you singling them out as opposed to all the other people that have gates? Uh, I'm not singling, I'm not talking about other gates. The, these gates, there's four gates there. Uh, the Bend of Islands is renowned for not having, like we we don't have any fences. Well, I know you don't. It have is a, it's a wildlife it's corridor. Specifically it's... talking about gates, not fences. Because mm -hmm. I haven't seen that they're putting up a fence, just gates. So I presume that's to stop people just accessing their driveway, like some of the other gates that are up in Bend of Isles. That's correct. Yeah. Right. Okay, no more questions. Any other councillor wishing to ask Michael a question? No. Thanks very much, Michael. Appreciate your time um, and staying, staying on for Thank us. Um, our next submitter is Sally Dinan, or Dinan, D I N A N. Oh, I just got booted out temporarily then, but I'm back. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, yeah, Sally Dynan, if you're there, Sally. Or Dinan, I'm sorry if I pronounced your surname incorrectly, but you can, you can help me out. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, sorry, it was just not allowing me access. I've just got to close something off. Okay, so I'll be presenting on, my, on behalf of myself and my husband, Nathan. We are the applicants. So we do acknowledge the nuance of the Bend of Islands, and in particular, my husband, Nathan, whose family are Indigenous, acknowledge this landscape. We are also very much aware of the immense fire risk in the area, and it was an awareness of this risk that prompted us to begin our journey with this application back in 2015. We have gone to advertising twice with this application. On the first occasion, the shed was much larger and the number of the trees to be removed much greater. After review and greater understanding of the BMO with Lisa Zhao and Mary Ann, the environmental officer, the shed size was reduced significantly, as were the number of trees to be removed. Our application would not exceed 25% or 2,000 square metres. We have measured this and we have had it surveyed. The location was selected from initial on-site pre-application meeting and after further discussion with Arborist, environmental officer and council. The location was selected due to minimal site excavation and minimal tree removal plus demonstrating our aim to retain and protect as many trees as possible. The visual offset is even greater due to our boundary starting further back from the road due to power lines and SPL's net space. Many existing trees would provide visual facade. The proposed location, location will negate the need to create a separate access way and is integral to its use for firefighting equipment storage. Aerial photography demonstrates clear precedence for buildings to be located within proximity to boundary due to the topography of the land. The size of the shed has been reduced. In fact, it has been reduced by 31.5 square metres. 
Therefore, the amount of vegetation to be removed has been reduced significantly. The necessity for fill has been mitigated. That's why have we have selected this area. Woodland grey is a non-obtrusive colour which blends well with the native landscape. The arborist assessment and after appraisal from the council's own arborist identifies zero large trees and zero habitat trees. Council's own arborist refers to the trees as having moderate volumes of dead wood and low useful life expectancy. Once again, we reiterate the council's own arborist assessment that the proposed localised removal of a relatively small volume of vegetation will have an overall negligible impact on the faunal habitat link objectives of the environmental significance overlay. The gates are not excessive in, in height. We've also recorded 37 examples of similar gates in the area, and we stopped counting at 37. Most of the same design, and in fact, some are bulkier. We are only trying to have these gates to protect our property as we have been robbed on a few occasions. We refer to the SUZ whereby fences may be prohibited, but gates are not. We refer to the council plan report stating the gates are standalone structures and can be considered under the special use zone. The assertion that it's a narrow frontage is incorrect. The gates would only equate to 5% of the total 270 metre frontage. And as the plan has stated, will not interrupt the open nature of the frontage. Thus, no faunal corridor is impaired. Our local fire station is unmanned on fire risk days and the shed, the purpose of the shed is for storing equipment and extra water storage, which would also provide extra, uh, excuse me, or extra opportunity for the community to defend because we would also be collecting extra water. We appreciate the bend of violence. We live here by choice, but we do wish to highlight that it is an environmental living zone and all risk factors should be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Um, just opening it up now for questions from councillors. Councillor Egan is first. Thanks, Councillor Perkins. Um, hi, Sally. Hi. Thank you for your submission. Um, so council's own arborists have actually stated that to move the shed site closer to the house, as our previous submitter um, said they would be okay with, means that you would have a greater impact on the trees. Is that correct? And you'd Absolutely. have to take more out. Because of the top topography of the land, the ex excavation would be greater, so it would have a greater impact on the root encroachment of the surrounding trees. And right, also, so you've got to do more earthworks as well. Yeah, and there's more trees in that area that are, they're, di they're more diverse, so they're more significant if they were to be removed, whereas the area that we've proposed, which is not far from um, the existing driveway, would actually just connect to the existing driveway by a small toppings path, that has trees that are less significant and it's considered a small negligible patch. Right. That was the only um, question I had. Thanks again for your submission. Thanks, Councillor Egan. Uh, Councillor Payne. Hi, Sally. Um, I'm just trying to clarify. Um, the shed will be for tanks for collecting water? Where it will have a tank attached to it, but we also want to be storing some firefighting equipment in there, which we've also attached with our planning application for reference. So you can see the equipment that we've lodged with that. Okay. Um, um, that's my question gone, I think. Great. Thank you. Holly, what, um, what's the name? What, what is the equipment? Because uh, the report that we got hasn't got the... Uh, well, not that I can see anyway. Uh, I can see the plans and the attachments, but I haven't got the photos of the equipment that you described. What, what? And through the photos with our, with our initial application, I've actually sent it through twice on two occasions because it's been requested of us, but they involve a, a pump on a trailer. There's a few um, pumping equipment. I could get my husband to forward it through with the actual model numbers for you, but we did list them itemised with their item numbers as well. And is that the only, only thing that will be in the shed, like firefighting equipment? Oh, we'll, we'll also have our trailer in there as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, the report talks about um, no planning application conference was held. Yes. Uh, due to circumstances expressed by the landowners. Are, are you able to elaborate on that? Like it's, you know, I certainly encourage... it, will, it will involve some personal references. So if you're happy, like I, I know you've had some people getting quite emotional today, but so if you want us to get into that, absolutely I can advise. Oh, I was just no. There was look. There were seven objectives, and certainly, um, 
it, it, it's a show of good faith from the applicant to meet with objectors in my view. But it, I also it, believe that it's a show of good faith from the actual objectors to maintain the personal privacy of the applicants. And we have wildlife cameras on our property to track the deer that are coming through. And we've actually had people trespassing on our property. We've had people leaving notes. We've had people walking on and filming us while we've been exercising and yelling at us and trying to basically bully us into um, withdrawing our application. So it was, you know, this was also during the pandemic. I have um, comorbidities. I didn't appreciate people walking onto my block without a mask. And it was just at the point where I think we were just going to be at loggerheads. And it's, we actually submitted on the 19th of the 10th, we actually submitted our own written response to Lisa Zhao, which she was to forward to the people that had put in their objections. So we did try and show good faith in in actually addressing the concerns of the submissions. But when it came to physically meeting with people, we feel that it had be gone beyond um, the civil nature of having a mediated discussion. All right, thanks, Sally. Um, if there are no other questions from councillors, I, I think... Uh, I've got a question. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Yeah. Thank you, Sally. Um, I've I'm wanting to um, uh, understand with the trees that are going to be removed, the nine trees that will be around where the shed is going, have you got plans to um, replant replacement trees? Okay, so I guess there's two facets to that. Firstly, as part of our application, we did have to um, contact some of the offset companies and we are able to achieve that offset and we do understand the necessary costs involved. Secondly, um, within your own council with Stephanie Orive, we have been engaged in our own replanting program to try and uh, build up some of the natural flora in our area. This was even outside of this planning application. It's just because we're trying to revegetate. So we've actually ourselves uh, planted 150 native um, pieces of vegetation, and we're continuing to do that. That's an active uh, replanting grant involved right now with Stephanie Orive, which you would be able to reference if you went through your own records. But certainly we are able to achieve the offset. We've received three quotes and um, that was part of our application as well. But within ourselves, we've also been doing our own planting. And certainly we, we from the very beginning, said we'd be happy to plant more as a facade along the front um, if it, you know, it was helpful with like the visual impacts of the structure. Yeah, that's great. Well done on the other plantings that you're doing. And it sounds like um, if the um, shed was to go ahead, the people in the area would like to see um, more trees in front to obscure the view. I've got two other questions about things that were raised, Sally. One is about the water tank. Are you Will that be attached to the outside of the shed or will you be putting that inside the shed? Well, uh, given that it's a given that it is a shed and it would be collecting water, there would be a tank on the outside. But the application that we have also put in is to have a, a, a trailer within the shed that would be mobile that would have the the tank on it and would have a pump and I can we can send you the actual um you know machine but to be able to drive that around our property because on high fire risk days our CFA is unmanned so we have to assess all sort certain factors of how we can defend our own personal safety and property if we were to be caught in the unfortunate circumstance of being stuck here in the case of a fire. And as you've touched on, um, you know, when you've been talking about the action plan earlier, that is a real risk for us, given that we're having this climate emergency, also given the rising in temperatures. So that's front of mind for us. We plan to live here for quite a long time. We're very young, so we're trying to set some things in place for, the own, for our own safety and the safety of the area. And I understand those um, tanks on um, tractor, uh, sorry, on, on trailers. My parents have got one on their property, which is, um, you know, I can visualise it completely and understand why you want to have one of those. The last question I had was about the gates. And with our last um, presenter, Michael, he mentioned about the gates being um, quite sizable. Are the gates attached to a fence? Like, is there a fence around the perimeter or would the gates just be standalone? There is no, we, we know that we can't have fences here. We don't want fences here. We don't want wallabies getting caught in fences. We would find that distressing and we have witnessed that ourselves. So we, that's not what we're trying to achieve. We have four access points. And so right now, 
anyone can drive down our driveway and just help themselves to anything. And like we lock our stuff away, but we've had we're on um, we're on gas bottles here as an example. We came home last year and our gas bottles had been stolen, so we were without, we were without gas for four days. So it's just to stop vehicles driving down. They would be on a timber post, just as just your standard farm gate. We've sent through the the um, plan of what it would look like. They're not obtrusive. They're not bold. Just a normal farm gate to stop people driving down our driveway, or just you know, sometimes like a truck will accidentally come down. You know, thinking that it, they're coming to our house, just to have a physical barrier. And I I don't think that that's an unreasonable request when you're on a property is to have just a little bit of safety to have a gate and. As I said, between Gonflers, like if you're looking at the streets, between Katani Boulevard, Gonflers and Ironbark, we drove around just to do a survey when Lisa requested it for of us. And we found 37 examples of similar gates. And we actually sent them through and we stopped counting because we've, we've seen so many. That doesn't include the ones on Ironbark. I mean, sorry, on Skyline Road. So I know that people get a little bit emotional when it comes to fences in this area, and I certainly can appreciate that. I, I do value the, the animals being able to walk freely, but I don't understand why it's okay for some people to have gates, but not others. It's not our fault we have four access points. That's just the way our block was when we bought it from the existing owners. And we just want to be able to put a gate there so we can lock it, and most of the time we'll probably keep it open. I can't be bothered opening and closing it all the time, but it's there just as a, a measure of safety if I'm here on my own or if we're travelling or when we have kids, just another level of safety. Thanks, Sally. Um, we've seen photos of the gates as well. That's come through to us. Really appreciate hearing um, your perspective tonight. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Sally, just one, one final question. Um, how long have you lived at the property? How long? And where did you live before then? I grew up in Hurstbridge, so I grew up in a mud brick home in Hurstbridge. My dad was a policeman um, in the police force, and I, I went to school locally, so I've lived in the area a long time. My husband lived in um, Diamond Creek his whole life. You know, we we, we have a, actually another um, property in Millenbeek. We're rate payers for a couple of properties. We choose to live in the Bendabar. How, how long have you lived at 56 Katoni Boulevard? Uh, it'll be 10 years next year. Okay. Yeah, no, just, a, just a, the um, application. We haven't just moved in and gone, oh, we're going to do this. You know, we, we had our pre application meeting back in 2015 with um, Lisa Bumstead, and we tried to figure out the best way to go about this. We're not trying to annoy anyone. We're just trying to live here. We're trying to live in an environmental living zone, but also finding a bit of balance. You know, it's not, it isn't a national park, it's an environmental living zone. And I think we need to find that balance between living here, protecting the flora and fauna, but also having the same opportunities that other people have had when they first built their homes here. And when you read through the report that Lisa Zell has presented, you know, we've had a senior planner looking at this, we've had our arborist, we've had Marianne, an environmental officer, we've had it all appraised and overlooked by their own arborist within the council and a bushfire management overlay report. Like, I think we've been pretty thorough in our presentation. I've lost Councillor Perkins. Here he is. No, sorry, I can still hear you, but I, I had a barking dog that needed to go inside. I'm going to stop barking. So sorry about that. Now, look, it was just the, the question was just in the context around, um, you know, that you said it a few times that you've got a, um, a fire station that is not manned, and, and so is the rest of Nellibic. Eltham Fire Station is one of 15 or so fire stations in the Shire that is staffed. Every, everyone else has volunteered. Uh, so in the Nellibic context, there's nothing particularly unusual about having volunteers provide the fire service. Literally no one's here on the fire risk days, like there's no one, they leave. So, and if you if you appreciate the high risk area that we're in and there's no one at, like the closest um, fire brigade would be 20 minutes away. I mean, on a, one of those days with those 100 kilometre winds, you've got to have some, you know, preventative measures up your sleeve and some options if you are stuck here. Obviously our initial... So what, do you, what, what do you do? How do you define a fire brigade if Christmas Hills doesn't quite cut the mustard? I'm not. I'm not saying anything against Christmas Hills. I'm saying that they're literally not there on the high fire risk days. They leave. I'm not sure that's that's the case, but anyway, um, it's, it's. I can prove that. That's that's fact. Well, they don't, they don't respond to fires on high risk days. The same. 
what I'm saying is they are not actually physically positioned at the fire brigade on fire risk days. They leave because the risk is greater to them, which is fair enough. They shouldn't be there if it's too risky. Anyway, interesting perspective. Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, councillors, I can ask for a motion. Actually, I've got one more submission to read. Sorry, Councillor Egan. I'm going to just do one more submission uh, before we go to a motion. And it's from Julie Martindale. Um, it's an object objection. The Bend of Islands Environmental Living Zone covered by a special council planning scheme known as SUZ2 is unique within the general planning scheme of things. Furthermore, the importance of the Bend of Islands within the broader regional and statewide context cannot be overstated. The Bend of Islands Land Management Plan 2013, in brackets, Karen Jolly and uh, Dylan Osler, PI, summarises the Bend as a unique residential area, dot, 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 characterised by large areas of continuous, uh, contiguous remnant bushland. Vegetation is considered high quality in both local and regional context. It has standing at state level and comprises two bio sites of state significance, uh, number 4987 and 4706, and is considered to make a high contribution to protecting the strategic natural values of the state and supports a rich diversity of flora that are depleted regionally, particularly uh, orchid taxa. It is also nominated as a site of state faunal significance, and that is site 60 around the Bend Cooperative. Um, in addition to providing habitat connectivity between the Yarra River, Warrandyte State Park and King Lake National Park um, in capitals, it is a very special place. Like most people looking to buy a property here, I was first attracted by the outstanding natural beauty of the area. Then through the Section 32 documents as part of the sale, I discovered the icing on the cake, the existence of the SUZ2. I strongly believe it's in its guiding principles and do not see the restrictions as a hindrance, rather a set, as a set of guidelines that allow residents to actively consider their physical and visual impact on the land. The purposes of the SUZ2 are clearly outlined and I would like to think that council understands what it makes, what it, what it is that makes the bend so unique and why residents are keen to preserve it and is willing to be proactive in ensuring what we want as individuals doesn't bit by bit diminish the place we all love. Among other things, the SUZ2 seeks to preserve, maintain, and enhance the environmental and landscape qualities of the area, limit site development to a single envelope, not exceeding 2,000 square metres, with uses grouped and arranged as, and arranged as close as possible, um, ensure that density, design, and appearance, and impact of development reflects the native bushland qualities of, of the area. Uh, I've got two more written submissions, councillors. Uh, I've got one from Ross and Christine Henry. Um, the last two are a bit shorter. We understand the applicant's desire to set themselves up properly for a home-based business. However, we feel that the development as, as proposed has avoidable adverse impacts in our very special environment in the Bend of Islands. We realise that the area of the shed has been reduced slightly to 90 uh, metres squared. However, when we consider the area of the platform for it, the batters for that platform, the driveway to the platform and the batters for that driveway, we believe the true impact would be approximately 250 square metres. This is a large area of existing undisturbed bush. As mentioned in our previous submission, the existing impacts on the, impacts on the property include a long loop of driveway to and from Katini Boulevard that encompasses a large area, including the, uh, the dwelling of outbuildings, tanks, etc. This area is generally disturbed ground and there seems to be adequate available space for the shed as proposed, for a shed as proposed. The existing outbuildings could remain undisturbed or alternatively they could be absorbed into a larger new shed. As mentioned in the planning scheme, split levels could be considered to assist in the reconfiguration. The planning scheme SUZ2 is very clear as its purpose to restrict and limit removal of natural vegetation and its clearing conditions. Uses shall be grouped and arranged as close as possible. The application as it stands does not satisfy these. Therefore, request that council work with the applicant to come up with a more appropriate design or, or reject the proposal. Also included in the application are four gates. Having lived in the area for 43 years, this seems strange and unnecessary. More suited to conventional suburban, resi uh, more suited to conventional suburban residential living. We believe there is one operating gate in the whole of the Bend of Islands. As the planning scheme is clear as to design, 
and mi minimal visual impact, four gates would indeed have visual impact. Perhaps instead, small discrete signs may serve as well. Um, and that's the submission from Ross and Christine Henry. Uh, we've got a final submission from D. Lucas. Uh, the agricultural impact statement indicates nine trees and, and in brackets, and one assumes associated an understory vegetation, close brackets, will be removed, um, including three large trees with a DBH of 33 centimetres, 46 centimetres and 48 centimetres. Retention of native vegetation, especially large habitat trees, should be a priority. There is a paucity of large hollow bearing trees in Bend of Islands and removing trees of this size only exacerbates the problem. I feel the proposed development should be rejected as it is unsuitable for the area and does not comply with the key provisions of the SUZ2. Removal of vegetation, the size and style of the shed and the siding it close to and siding it close to the road will impact visual amenity. The development proposal does not embrace nor maintain the environmental values or native bushland qualities of Bend of Islands and therefore, therefore should be rejected. Um, and they are all the submissions, councillors. So uh, I'll look for a motion and I've got uh, the Ward Councillor, Councillor Amtran. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Um, before I move on, I was just wondering if I could ask a question through the chair of Rosa. Yes. Um, I'll just, uh, just wait for them to bring Rosa into the meeting. Hi, Rosa. Good evening, councillors. Hi, Rosa. Um, just wanted to ask a question because um, it seems that there's a, a discrepancy between uh, what Sally said before and what I'm reading in some submissions, just in terms of the building footprint, um, if the shed were to go in. By my calculations, um, and I did some calculations when I first saw this application, I I calculated that it would go over that maximum and it seems that some of the submitters are saying it will but Sally said that by their calculations it wouldn't so I was just wondering if you'd be able to clarify that. Um, if, if you could bear with me I'll just try and find that for you. Um, sorry. Point twenty nine. Sorry. Point twenty nine talks about the extent of vegetation clearances not in accordance with the special use zone. Is that irrelevant? No, I think you're asking whether the overall size of the, the um, building with regard to the size of the um, site is appropriate in, in terms of built built area. Is that? Yeah, that's right. An area. The the provision about um, building footprint. Yeah. On a property, and that um, the building the footprint of all buildings on the property, there's a maximum footprint for that. Um, yeah, it's my understanding that this would push it above that, and that that was being treated as discretionary. Um, yeah, sorry to cut you off. Keep going. Yeah, that's that's clarifying. Oh, okay, all right. So in the report, at around about, I think it is. Um, uh, paragraphs uh, 20 onwards, um, it talks about the siding and design of the outbuildings um, and it talks about the, the setbacks under the special use zone. Um, it also talks about, you know, identifying an appropriate location. Um, so it's not quantified is what I'm getting at, um, but uh, so, so it's very much about, you know, finding the appropriate location with respect to the, char the characteristics of the site and the setbacks that are identified. Okay, thanks, Rosa. But in terms of the size of it, so the, the size of the shed plus the size of the existing buildings, um, I believe there's a certain percentage of the block size that that needs to be under in the special use zone. Um, the proposed out building... Uh, let me just find that. First point of paragraph 29 talks to, um, you know, the objections raised concerns that the oak building would result in clearance exceeding 2,000 square metres. The exact area of existing clearance to propose clearance is not clear. However, the zone affords council discretion to consider a variation to this requirement 
in instances where site constraints or length of access ways would make such requirements impractical. Yeah. So again, it comes down to the siting and design of the building um, and considering the constraints of the building as opposed to really um, a construction sort of envelope that, you know, or size of a construction envelope. Well, you've got it there in the dot points where you say um, the outbuilding's been clustered with the existing development, but also the other point, it's on relatively flat land and minimising the need for extensive earthworks, which would have resulted in further impact and removal. Um, I'd rather less impact than more. If they were to move it, it's going to have more. Now, paragraph 29 talks to, as, as Councillor Perkins identified, it talks to that 2000 and that there is no hard and fast rule that it has to... Um, Stick right. to that 2,000 square metres, there's discretion there. Okay, thanks, Rosa. That's, I think that's answered my question. Yeah, discretion to vary it or not to vary it. Yep. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, so you have the floor, Councillor Entry. Great. Um, I'll... Me, I'm able to ask one more question through the chair. Yep. Thank you. Um, we heard from um, one of the submitters. Um, it was, oops, I did have that written down, I think, Mr Henry. Um, and there was an assertion made that the applicant is wanting to build the shed to run a business from. And I was just wondering through Rosa whether she had any information about that or whether it might be possible to uh, recall Sally so that she might be able to answer the question as to if that's true and what the business nature would be. Is that possible? Uh, through the chair, um, the application as submitted to council um, uh, clearly states that the shed is for um, firefighting purposes or to house equipment for firefighting purposes. It is, does not allude to and in none of our um, documentation that forms part of this application have we um, received information that indicates that it will be used for a business purpose. Misinformation. All right, uh, Councillor Entrain, do you have a motion? Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Perkins. I'd like to move that the committee acting under delegation from Council issues a notice of decision to refuse to grant a permit to the land located at 56 Katani Boulevard, Band of Islands, for buildings and works to construct an outbuilding gates, removal of vegetation and associated earthworks on the following grounds. One, the de development is not responsive to the special use zone schedule two of the Nolbit planning scheme with respect to the following the sizing of the outbuilding, the overall size of the outbuilding, the increase in site coverage as a result of the proposed outbuilding and additional driveway area, the proposed gates being a visual barrier along the frontage of the site, and the extent of native vegetation removal to facilitate the construction of the outbuilding. Two, the development is not responsive to the environmental significance overlay schedule one of the Nolbit planning scheme with respect to the following, the extent of native vegetation removal to facilitate the construction of the outbuilding. Thank you, Councillor Entrand. Do you have a seconder? Or do we have a seconder? Uh, yes, I'll, I'm, I'll second. Councillor Payne, thank you. Uh, back to you, Councillor Entrand. Yes, thank you. Um, look, I'll just start by, by responding to, to what Sally said um, about the, the bullying. And I found that incredibly distressing to hear. And I'm so sorry that you've been put through that, Sally. Um, that really is not what I know of the Bend of Islands community at all. I know no the Band of Islands community to be an incredibly close, um, tight-knit community uh, who all really uh, are cohesive and really care about the area where they live and all work together for it. So to hear that that happened, I find very, very distressing and I'm very sorry to hear that. But it can't be considered as part of this permit application. Um, and it sounds like a planning app application conference. While I understand why you might not necessarily have wanted to go down that path, it sounds like that could have brought out some of the things, especially what we heard from, from Michael, from Bicker, about um, the fact that there are certain changes that could be made to this that would make the shed more acceptable. Um, we, we heard before about the discretionary requirement about footprint on a site in Bend of Islands and um, what this permit really hinges on. And our, uh, this is with, with issues of native vegetation removal aside. What this permit really hinges on is the maximum site coverage 
of a block in the special use zone. Um, and that is at council's discretion as to whether we allow a landowner to go above that maximum footprint. What we've got here is a property that's already got three buildings on it, two, one house, two studios. So that is sufficient on, that is sufficient on-site storage external to the property for the storage of all sorts of different equipment. Um, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't seem necessary, or reasonably necessary to go so far above, to go above the building footprint when there are already two studios on the site. And um, I think the word used was impractical, um, that the, the maximum the maximum footprint were, would be impractical. I don't think it's impractical to say that you could use one of the existing outbuildings as storage. So that I think is really what this hinges on and whether we treat that discretionary requirement as impractical. And in this case, I do not think that it's impractical. And that's why I think the deployment should be refused. Um, so look, thank you to all the presenters. Um, I think it re was really good to hear uh, both from Michael and Sally and everybody else who sent in a tight submission. And it shows really what the Bend of Islands community is about. Uh, I think one thing that really rang true amongst everybody who spoke um, was that people really care about the environment and Bend of Islands and protecting the place for what it is. Um, and our job as a council is to make the hard decisions about what that looks like uh, in a strong planning context. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Entry. And over to you, Councillor Payne. Um, I, I don't have much to say, only to um, to say that I'm supporting uh, Councillor Ramtram because I think he's kind of got the lead on this uh, particular um, application. Um, I think there's a lot of grey areas with this one in terms of the size of the shed, what it's actually being used for, the number of gates. Bend of Isles is the last gated community I would have associated at all, um, anywhere. And um, I think there are a number of questions about um, how it's working in terms of that community. So a little bit shocked to hear about that, the kind of both the theft and or perhaps aggression that, that may be happening there. But um, I can only support um, the fact that there are gray areas about uh, this particular application. Thank you, Councillor Payne. Now I look for a councillor who wishes to speak against the motion and then we'll go against four. Against four. Uh, councillor Regan, against the motion. Yes, thank you, Councillor Perkins. Um, yes, I'm against this for, I mean, against Councillor Ramcharan's motion for a whole lot of reasons. First and foremost, the fact that council staff have recommended that it does receive a permit. Um, the chances of it getting through at BCAT are incredibly high. Now, I've, she's already said why there's so many gates. They've got four entrances into the property. So if you can't have a basic human right to protect yourself against theft, and she's not saying that it's theft by other people in bigger, she's saying it's obviously other people. I mean, I've had people break into my place, but it's not people, my neighbours, it's people from outside. Um, and I know that there are gates everywhere in bigger because I've been driving around and counting them too, and I've got friends that have lived there. And some of them have amazingly huge, massive sculptured um, gates. Um, our job is not just to look after the environment, it's also to look after people. This It's totally impractical for them to use one of the studios to store a trailer. Um, first of all, it wouldn't get through the door, having seen the, the studios. And to if you go by what um, some of the submitters wanted, and that is to move the shed and reduce it slightly so it would get through from your point of view, um, Councillor Ramcharan, you're going to cause more damage to the environment. More trees will have to come out and there's more earthworks. So I don't want that. I want the least possible. And this, this will get through at VCAT and then we'll have just ratepayers' money being wasted at VCAT again. There's obviously been a lot of misinformation put out by submitters, which is, again, to, to muddy the waters and, as Councillor Jeff Payne called it, um, grey issues to say that it's a business is just nonsense. Um, that's about all I want to say. Um, I'll leave it there, but I'll be voting against it. And I certainly advise the residents to go straight to VCAP because you'll most likely win this one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Egan. Any councillor wishing to speak in favour of the motion? No, any other councillor wishing to speak? Oh, I had Councillor Stockman with his hand up. 
Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, look, I think there's good people in this world and there's bad people, and I think Sally's a, a good person, and I think um, listening to her submit was um, a really big turning point for me. I actually um, believe what she's saying, I really do, and I think she's got good intentions, and I think she'd be a great neighbour, and if she could only... Um, but she'd been there 10 years, but if the neighbours could see um, how good a person her and her husband are, I think um, that would go a long way, and I think you said that, um, to Councillor Perkins that... Um, be good if she could approach some of the neighbours. Um, but, yeah, I think she's doing two good things, and one is um, the gate will stop theft. I, I have it quite often on a rural properties. People just seem to just drive in your driveway and, you know, you, you still live in the house and you still got windows and all of a sudden someone's at your front door and, there's, you know, it's, it's actually quite um, disturbing even if, it, if you're there, but let alone if, you, if you're not um, and they're looking around your place. So I think um, it is important to um, have, have gates, whilst I do understand the makeup of Bender Viles not having fences, but the actual gates will stop a vehicle of you know, three or four people coming in in a car. And the other point was the, um, the firefighting, and I think we've talked about it before, if there's a, an arsonist, well, there are bad people in the world too, and, and they've started a fire or something, and they can put that out, they're saving the whole neighbourhood, they're saving the whole you know, Nolimbic sometimes. So it's, um, I think it's, they should be commended, but I'll be um, voting against the motion as Thank well. Thank you, Councillor Stockman. Next, I have Councillor Duffy and then Councillor Eyre. Thank you. Um, I came to this um, meeting not knowing very much about this um, application except for what I'd read. And so I've listened intently to the submissions and, um, you know, particularly to Michael, who was here in person tonight, and to Sally. And um, I believe that um, this is probably, a, you know, it is a very sensitive area. Um, you know, in my position on the Green Wedge and protecting the Green Wedge, that's something that's very personal to me. In this instance, listening to what Sally has said, listening to her explanation, listening to the um, plantings that they've already done, 150 to, you know, vegetate, she deeply cares about the land. She has an understanding for it. Her husband does too. The fact that she's, um, you know, that it's an, an Indigenous family, when Sally referenced that, you know, there's a deep connection to the land and not wanting to do anything to destroy it, I think that that needs to be respected as well. I understand that this is a planning application and there are rules around that, but I'm hearing from Sally a real appetite to try and make sure that the, um, the locals in the Bend of Islands, um, uh, um, uh, there, it, there's a, a, a sympathetic approach to that. So keeping the, go the gates open most of the time, planting trees um, in front of um, the, the shed to be able to grow to kind of help disguise it. And I would imagine with that there would be understory that would be planted as well over time. So that's the sort of thing that I would like to see with um, this planning permit to give some assurance to the other people of the Bend of Islands that, you know, it isn't going to be, um, you know, a huge impost into the land. It's actually from what I've heard in its positioning, it's going to be less environmentally damage, damaging than if it was somewhere else. So I, at this stage, um, plan to vote against the motion based on what I've heard tonight. Thank and you, also the, the comment about, you know, the business, you know, there are grey areas and I think, you know, when there are grey areas, more information probably should be um, obtained so that there aren't grey gray areas. So that's another reason for me to vote um, um, listening towards what Sally has got to say. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Councillor Eyre, or Mayor Eyre, sorry. Thanks, uh, Councillor Perkins. I'm still a little bit unsure of where I'm going with this as I have a question for Rosa. Is it okay through the chair to ask a question of Rosa? Yep. Thank you. Um, hi, Rosa. Thanks for coming back. Um, can you just um, answer for me? Um, because planning is uh, complex. Um, if we were to go with Councillor Ramcharan's motion, what uh, steps are there for Sally there? Is that it finished? Can um, they redesign it? Is the application closed? Like what? Can you just step me through that, please? Well, through the chair, um, Sally, as the applicant, can appeal the decision of council 
um, to VCAT. So she has that avenue and then it's up to VCAT to, to make a ruling um, for or against. Um, so there is that, that avenue still available for her. Okay, so that would be the next avenue. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, and that would be costly as well and council would need to send um, uh, an officer or... Uh, through the chair, yes, council would be present at any appeal, um, uh, depending on um, whether Sally wishes to um, do the appeal herself or engage a consultant or, or any experts, that's really, um, you know, something for her to determine. Um, but the costs can start to mount, um, particularly when you start to include, you know, consultants and, and any um, experts. Council probably, given if we were to go with Council Councillor Ramcharan's um, uh, motion or recommendation, we would likely send an advocate on our behalf because it's uh, um, overturning the council the officer recommendation. So Lisa wouldn't go. We would get an advocate to appear on our behalf. So that's a cost to council in this instance. Thank you for clarifying those steps, Rosa. Um, uh, I, I um, am not able to support uh, Councillor Ramcharan's motion um, based on, on this process. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor. I suppose while, while you're still there, Razor, I, I think it's fair to present uh, the other side of the coin um, and ask that question, uh, you know, if, if the objectors uh, appeal Council's decision, which might be to support the officer recommendation, uh, what council doesn't go to VCAD, like is we hands off approach, or, or what, what's the implication of that? Have we got a duty to defend the case either way? So, sorry, um, I missed the first half of it, but I'm uh... Uh, probably, you know, the, you know, do we not have a duty to defend uh, council's decision regardless of what council decides to do? Uh, so, Absolutely, yes. if, if you know, it, it's open to objectors to take council to VCAD if we grant the permit, and that's still a cost to council. Yes, that's right. But in so, that instance, um, we may send, um, depending on resources and so forth, we, we would probably likely send um, the planner that dealt with this particular application because they have all the knowledge. Um, if we went with Councillor Rantaran's um, recommendation, we would definitely send an advocate, not the planner that dealt with the application. Yep, okay. Sorry, Councillor Ranchan, did you have a question or some of them? You you asked my question. Thanks, Councillor. Oh, really? Okay, thank you. Um, look, you know, my, my position is is I certainly um, special use zone is a is a very restrictive zone. You know, council uh, planning generally, uh Nilabig is known as it's a hard planning scheme um, in any case, right across the municipality, but the special use zone is a is a standout. Um, this is an area that is very, very restrictive. Um, quite purposeful uh, in, in, in terms of um, why it is restrictive and we all, all know why it is. Um, it is up to council to, you know, show that, uh, you know, to, to follow the, the zoning uh, um, um, sort of parameters or, 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 or to waiver it. And, in, you know, in this case, the officer recommendation um, seems to... Uh, on the side of varying uh, what the special use zone tries um, to achieve. Um, seven objectors in this part of the world is a, is a huge number of objectors. Um, certainly, I'm, I'm happy to support the ward councillor and the, and the local community. Um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that there wasn't a, a consultation um, meeting. I think it, it should have happened. Um, people don't resolve issues by avoiding each other and, and, and not, not meeting. That doesn't go well for the applicant, in my view. Uh, you know, a fire station 500 metres up the road and, and the applicant wishes to build another fire station um, two-thirds the size of it. Um, you know, the concern that uh, the firefighters won't be around on a high-risk day, well, I wonder whether the applicant should be in that case. Uh, but, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm very strongly in support of Councillor Ramtran's um, Motion. I think it's the right. It's the right. Well, it's the right decision on behalf of Councillor Antra. Anyway, I hope it gets council support. Um, this is not the sort of thing that council wants to 
be remembered for in uh, helping to, uh, you know, devalue uh, in the environmental sense, um, the special use zone in the Bend of Isles. So I'm certainly very supportive of the, the local residents here, in, including um, the applicant. And, uh, you know, I think it's an overdevelopment of the site and it's, it's not supported for the special use zone. Um, the gates as well, I don't see the point of having, having gates and no fences. Uh, it seems a bit silly to me. Um, it's it's just a it's, it's it's built form and structures in in a place that, that doesn't warrant it. So I'll be voting in support of Councillor Antrens' motion. All right, I think everyone's had their say now, Councillor. So uh, we'll put the motion to the vote. Oh, right of reply. oh sorry, yes, of course, Councillor Antrens. Yeah, right of reply. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Um, look, I'll just touch on on what we discussed before in, in regards to the process after this. Uh, it is equally likely, I think, that it will go to VCAT, no matter which way we, we decide on this. It will either be the applicant taking it to VCAT if we reject or the objectors most likely taking it to VCAT if we approve it. So council will be fighting this in VCAT no matter what happens. So will the applicant, so will the objectors most likely. Um, in, in terms of what we make these decisions on, we have to make the decision on what's been presented to us, what's in front of us. It's not about um, who the applicant is or um, feeling, feeling sorry for them or anything like that. It, is, it, is, it must be based on the application that's been made. Um, I don't think it's fair to suggest that the shed is being used for, for a business. It is, I believe, for fire, fire equipment and that's what we're granting the permit for. So that's what would be stored there. But at the end of the day, there is sufficient offsite storage already on that property. Um, and I think Councillor Perkins was absolutely right when he said that this, this is varying the conditions in the special use zone. It is a variation of the condition that has a maximum building footprint in the Bend of Islands, um, which is discretionary, yes, but we're varying it. We're varying the, the objectives of the special use zone by forgoing that clause. Um, and I think that is really why this, this permit should be rejected. Um, so please make a decision based on what's in front of you. Um, that's our job as councillors. And um, we, we can't let emotions come into this one. It really has to be based on what's in front of us, what's in the planning scheme, and what we really truly believe is most appropriate for the special use zone. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Entrant. All right, we will put the motion to the vote. All those in favour for the motion? And against? The motion's carried. Uh, so uh, just rounding out tonight, uh, there's no supplementary urgent business, no confidential reports. And I can declare the meeting closed and thank councillors and, and submitters for your time tonight. Sorry, Councillor Perkins, I was muted. Could we have um, the vote again so that we can call out our names, please? Oh, are you are calling a division? Yep. Yep, all right. Um, division on the last, the last vote, all those in favour? And it's... Councillor or Councillor Ramtran, Councillor Payne, Councillor Perkins, and Mayor Eyre, and against. It is Councillor Duffy, Councillor Egan, and Councillor Stockman. All right, so uh, I didn't quite get to close the meeting. I hope that didn't confuse governance at all. I, I slip of the tongue there. Um, but uh, no supplementary urgent business, uh, no confidential reports. And I declare the meeting closed now at 20 past 10 and thank everyone for attending and for your work tonight and the submitters as well. So thanks all. Thank you.